Okay, good morning, and I'll call to order the February 3rd, 2020 uh, regular meeting of the Haywood County Board of Commissioners. Our first order of business will be our Pledge of Allegiance, and after that I'm going to ask our Chaplain, Reverend Patrick Womack, to come forward for invocation. So if everyone would please uh, rise for the uh, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. May we pray. Gracious God, our Father in heaven, we give you praise and we thank you that on this day we may gather here to see the business of the people conducted. We're grateful for these, your servants, who are placed in these positions, from commissioner to those who serve in other capacities. Father, thank you for the time they dedicate that we may have good governance. And so we pray for wisdom and discernment that in the consideration of decisions that each will have the ability to listen, to consider, and to act on the basis of what is right and good. And so we commit all to you, and we ask your blessing. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, our next order of business is our public uh, hearings or uh, public, uh, or call to public hearings, and we have none of those. Our public comment is usually next, and I'm going to put it to after agency, uh, administrative agency reports, because um, the, we've got three of those, and one of them is our county employees, and then Dr. Shelley White from the HCC, and uh, Josh uh, Morgan from Shine Rock Classical Academy, and they all need to get back to their, uh, to their uh, schools, and our employees, need, uh, they can go to work if they so choose. So, um, I'm just going to put that off just for just for a little bit, probably be out about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'll get to public comment since I have several people signed up at this time. So uh, I'm going to move to an introduction of county employees with uh, our county manager, Bryant Moorhead. Good Thank morning, you, Mr. Bryant. Chairman. I uh, have a few. Uh, when I call your name, please stand, remain standing. Uh, Health and Human Services, we have April Partain, Susan Alderman. Tanya Sorto, Casey Hopkins, the Sheriff's Office, we have Teresa Mitchell, and Development Services, we have Douglas Plemons and Zachary Williams. Not everybody's here, but uh, these are our new employees. I'd also like to introduce our uh, new Animal Services Director. He hasn't uh, started yet. His first day will be February 17th, but he's here visiting and uh, actually uh, moving some things to, to Haywood County. So his name is Howard Martin. Okay. Right. Howard uh, and his wife Molly are really excited about moving here. They have a, a son who's a graduate assistant at ECU. Um, Howard has a BA in organizational management and he's also a certified public manager uh, with a certificate from Florida State. Uh, before coming to Haywood County, he's been the uh, animal services director for Onslow County. That's uh, Jacksonville, North Carolina and uh, most of his career has been in law enforcement down in Florida where he's always had a focus on animals, either through their ag uh, side or uh, working with the canine officers. Uh, we had a lot of great candidates for animal services director. Howard uh, stuck out not just on his resume, but through the interview process. He's committed to the welfare of animals. Uh, we're excited to have him here. He's, he's really committed to in uh, developing our staff and, and, and making sure that we have a top-notch organization. We're just really excited to have him, and I'd ask him to say a few words if he'd like to. Please. Everybody else can sit. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Good, morning, Good morning, Chairman, Vice Chair, Commissioners, Mr. Moorhead. Uh, it's ecstatic to be here. We're excited to come to uh, Haywood County. Um, it's been a goal of ours and the opportunity, and we're here, and we're looking forward to it. I hate to look in the rearview mirror after pulling a trailer load of furniture that I'm leaving, and, but uh, we should be on uh, permanently here by next week, and 
I'm excited at the opportunities for uh, the Animal Services Department. Looking forward to meeting the staff and uh, building a relationship with them, and they are the foundation of uh, is your staff. But thank you again. Okay. Thank you for coming thank on you. board. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate all our employees uh, that y'all are wanting to work for Haywood County. We appreciate We always want to do this to introduce you so we get to know you and you get to know us. So just thank y'all for uh, wanting to work for Haywood County. If y'all want to go to work, you can, but if you want to stay for the meeting, you, you can do that also. Uh, so our next uh, item of the administrative agency reports is introduction of Haywood Community College President, Dr. Shelley Wyatt. We have our program administrator, David Francis, and welcome this morning. Good morning, commissioners. Hope everybody's doing well after the Super Bowl. It's my honor to introduce Dr. Shelley Watt. She's the seventh president of Haywood Community College. Dr. Watt is an 18-year resident of Haywood County. She served as Vice President of Economic and Workforce Development, Community Education at Asheville Buncombe Technical Community College for five years and was with AB Tech for 18 years. In this role, she led a dynamic division serving over 14,000 students and clients annually through workforce, continuing education, community enrichment, customized training programs, the Small Business Center, and incubation programs. During her tenure at AB Tech, Dr. White oversaw the development of the Composites Training Center of Excellence for GE Aviation, which we have a lot of folks who work at GE Aviation up from Canton here. She is also a partnership and grant development to bring supportive services to short-term workforce and training for students facing obstacles. As a graduate of Isle Thermal Community College, Dr. White received her doctorate in education from Western Carolina University. She served as a state-level president of the North Carolina Community College Adult Educators Association, an organization supporting workforce training programs through professional development, networking, and advocacy. Dr. White partnered with the Economic Development Coalition of Asheville, Buncombe County and Mountain Area Workforce Development Board planned educational services for the new transformation village of Asheville, Buncombe Community Christian Ministries and served on the board of Children's Welfare League of Asheville and Buncombe County. Dr. White joined the HCC team as of January 1st of this year. It's my honor to introduce Dr. White. Good morning. Thank Good morning. you so much for having me here today. I'm very excited to be a part of Haywood Community College and to bring my work from the Asheville Buncombe area to Haywood County, which is my home. Um, my husband's from Haywood County and we settled here many years ago and have had the opportunity to, to bring my work here and I can't tell you how excited I am about, about that. Um, the past month, I've been, uh, it's been a whirlwind as I've been getting to know everyone on campus, getting to know our campus facilities, and now starting to broaden that and start to reach out into the community and meet with partners and get out and meet our stakeholders and other key uh, members of our partnerships here in the county. So I look very forward to working with you. Uh, as we continue into the future. Uh, one thing that I knew about Haywood Community College is how important it is to the community, but now that I'm in this role, I see that even more, because now everywhere I go, people tell me about what Haywood Community College means to them, what it's meant to their families, and I look forward to helping lead the college into the future. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome, Dr. White. We, uh, I know you, you know, we had a great president, Dr. Parker, and uh, was, she was very vocational, uh, you know, and I, w looking at your resume, I feel like the, the Board of Trustees made a great choice uh, because vocations are, I, I think, I, I feel like, I always felt like when I first became a commissioner, like, you know, a long, long time ago, that maybe they weren't focusing on uh, vocationals like they should have been. And I know that based on your background and what I've heard you, you know, people say about you and stuff, you're going to focus on that. And that's, a, that's really uh, what I'd like to see in the community college. So I, I think they made the, a great choice and the right choice in, in, in bringing you on this morning. Did, Thank you. Thank you very much. Did anybody else want to say anything? No, I'm glad you're here, and we look forward to working with you. Yes, we do. We do. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. And welcome to work. Okay, and then our next uh, item of the agency reports is their Shine Rock Classical Academy presentation. And we have Shine Rock Classical Academy head of school, Joshua Morgan, here this morning. And welcome, Josh and Joshua. And uh, I know you've got a little bit of a presentation, I think, Candy, and that we can watch. So welcome, welcome this morning. Thank you, and uh, uh, commissioners, thank you for having me here and uh, having the opportunity to come and 
uh, share with you our school. Uh, and uh, uh, certainly as we go along, you know, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, you know, you're not going to hurt my feelings if you interrupt. Uh, Maybe a blessing for everybody else because I could probably get up here and talk all morning long and, and get all caught up with the, the excitement for our school. Uh, as, as the presentation comes uh, together there, uh, I may be a little hard to follow because I'm not going to read all the prompts off to everybody there, so I'm going to spare you that. Uh, but I will add uh, some context to some of the information that is there. Uh, we are uh, a school uh, that is a, a charter school. Our initial charter was for five years. Uh, and our, the first classes began in August of 2015. Uh, so we are, of course, at the end of that five-year charter, and I'll tie that in here at the end uh, whenever we get to that. Um, one of the things about our school uh, that I'm very proud of is that we uh, have really fostered a lot of partnerships across our community and across many different areas. Uh, some of the things that we have been able to do just as a facility and where we're located uh, there on Dellwood, that is um, part of the assembly grounds. So we obviously have a good partnership and relationship with the Junaluska Assembly. Uh, we also have relationships with a couple of churches uh, to help us with additional facilities as well as, uh, I have to do my own driving, that is courageous. Uh, the, uh, the other thing that we, um, do as well is we have uh, facilities for our athletics. So we use another church uh, to help for uh, some of our facilities there as well. We also use uh, Cataloochee Ranch uh, and have a partnership with them for cross country. Uh, so we have several partnerships across the community that are more than just the physical layout of the school. Um, the next piece, just looking there is in terms of um, understand what a charter school is, because I think that's one of the things that um, in my role, in my current capacity, is that we uh, sometimes have to f educate what a charter school actually is. It, it is a public school body. Uh, you know, and being a public school, uh, that means that we get funding from uh, the state government, we get, state, uh, we get federal funds, we also get funds from the county. Uh, so we are a publicly Fund. We are a publicly funded school. We are not a private school. There is not a tuition to attend. Um, all you have to do is uh, apply. Uh, you know, and that open enrollment period is going on now. But that's really the only uh, thing that you have to do. And you have to be a resident of North Carolina. We do have students, obviously, primarily from Haywood County. We do have a few students from Buncombe County and a few students as well as from Jackson County uh, as well. Our focus is expeditionary learning, which means that what we are focusing on is getting kids connected with the world around them, getting them uh, able to connect what they're learning in the classroom to the world outside. Uh, I mentioned our relationship with the assembly. Uh, we have a great relationship with them. They allow us to be able to use an outdoor classroom that's on the campground facilities right beside us. Uh, there's a creek that we go into uh, just about every week uh, in some form or fashion, uh, academic purposes uh, you know, is, is what we do there with that. Uh, not purely recreation, but uh, we do go and, and enjoy those things there with that. The, the other thing about us being a public school is that we are uh, governed by a board. Uh, these boards, this board is a volunteer board, uh, and they are accountable to all policies uh, and state guidelines as well. Uh, it, it's certainly fair to say that we've had a few bumps with that, but we've really worked hard uh, to change that. We've worked really hard to uh, promote transparency. Uh, every meeting, uh, every one of our board meetings are uh, audio recorded and they're available for the public to listen to anytime. Uh, we have financial transparency there as well. Uh, it's simply, uh, you know, just have to go to the about and resources and documents. Um, and you've got all sorts of, of resources to, to follow along there with that. Uh, another misconception about charter schools is that we don't provide uh, lunches or we don't provide transportation, and that's not true. Uh, we actually provide hot lunches uh, to our students every day, and we also provide transportation. Uh, we provide zone busing. Uh, across the county. That's why we can have a little bit different schedule than Haywood County Schools uh, because we're not going uh, to the ends of the county like they're, they're forced to. Uh, our zone busing, we go uh, 
from Balsam back this way. Uh, and then we also go through Clyde and uh, pick up in Canton. Uh, so as long as those roads are good um, and it's safe for the, our population to go, then we're able to maintain pretty close to a normal schedule. Uh, com and that's why uh, when anytime Haywood County Schools changes their schedule, our phone lights up, we're operating as usual um, and, and going right along there with that. Um, the other thing uh, that we uh, have really focused on is making sure that we have uh, student health and safety uh, addressed. Uh, we do have a full-time SRO uh, on campus. We also have a full-time guidance counselor uh, there as well. Uh, you'll also notice that we offer each of those uh, electives and specials, uh, including Spanish, uh, to our elementary students each week. Uh, so all of our students are getting Spanish education. Uh, getting into funding, uh, and this is one of the things that is, uh, again, a significant piece. And you can see Haywood County Schools, they, they have funding, and I think most people are, are pretty familiar with all of those funding sources. As a charter school, we do not get all of those funds. Uh, we do get a state ADM, and we do get federal funds for uh, students with special needs and for a free and reduced lunch population. Uh, we also get a local supplement from the county commissioners and, and our county government. However, if any of those funds are, are earmarked as capital outlay, we do not uh, get those funds. And uh, in turn, we do not get any capital outlay funds from the state, uh, nor do we get any transportation money or lottery money. Uh, so when it comes to facilities, uh, we have to be able to make that work within uh, the ADM that's allotted to us, uh, which puts us being funded uh, somewhere between 78 uh, to 81 percent of the county system, uh, to, to give you a marker of, of what we're doing there with that. Uh, academically, uh, we have uh, demonstrated growth o over the last year. Uh, we were able to improve our report card grade by 11 points. Uh, we were very proud of that, and we were also uh, you know, able to demonstrate uh, high growth, uh, or not high growth, we met or exceeded growth uh, in reading, math, uh, math and overall. Uh, there were four schools in the county that were able to do that, and we were happy to be one of those four uh, to be able to do that. Uh, if you compare us to all charter schools, uh, we performed in the top 35% uh, in terms of growth, uh, and that's consistent with all public schools in Western North Carolina, uh, and as well as in North Carolina as a whole. So one of the things that we also focus on in terms of our expeditionary learning is uh, providing opportunities uh, for our kids that are a little bit uh, unique. Uh, all of the activities that you see there on the left-hand side, those are um, overnight capstone trips that our students participate in. Um, part of our expectation is that every student will go on five fieldwork experiences, uh, field trips, you know, if you want to look at them that way. Uh, we get them off campus in a way uh, to where they can apply what they're learning in the classroom out. Those particular activities, those are all overnight field trips. Every grade level participates in an overnight field trip with the exception of kindergarten uh, for the obvious reasons. We do not take kindergartners and spend them overnight somewhere. Uh, but every other grade level we do. And um, those are really um, educational and they are really just family events, to be honest with you. We have a lot of parents that go with chaperones. Uh, it really unites our school, uh, these capstone activities and capstone events um, as we move forward with there. We've also worked to make our middle school experience uh, more authentic. And you can see the electives that we offer for all of our middle schoolers uh, there, including uh, robotics and, and a visual and media arts. A, a lot of the flyers that you see uh, about Shining Rock right now, they've been produced by our visual arts team. They've been produced by middle schoolers. So if you're around the county uh, and you see a, a trifold blo uh, brochure, that was produced by our middle schoolers, uh, as well as any of the flyers that you see from, from our school. M middle schoolers did the graphics work on that. Um, we also offer Spanish 1 for our 8th grade, uh, in addition to Math 1 and English 1. Uh, so we have a, a, a number of students who are going to leave with up to three high school credits uh, before they, they leave our school. Uh, looking ahead, uh, you know, there are a couple of things, of course, that we have on our agenda that we want to be able to take care of, and this is 
uh, a part of our strategic plan that's, again, on our, our website. Uh, the, the first, of course, is to continue our academic growth. Uh, that's why we're here, uh, is to educate our students at a high level um, and make them successful you know, for the challenges that they face now, but also the, the challenges to come. Uh, the next piece is to establish a permanent facility. Uh, like I said, we have a, a great partnership with the Assembly, but uh, that's still their property, and, and for us to be a, a long-term uh, part of this community, we, we need to be able to establish a permanent facility with that. Um, you know, of course, without the capital outlay funds, that makes that a, a unique challenge, and uh, we're working through that process and, and, and being able to develop with that. Um, with that would come some expansion uh, towards a high school to where we could be a K-12 school in, instead of uh, K-8. Uh, so that's also a part of our strategic plan. Uh, one of the things that is sort of looping back uh, to one of the first points is that uh, the initial charter for us was a five-year charter. And of course, beginning in 2015, that means that it is up. Uh, we are on the very end right now of a, a two-year process of charter renewal. Um, and right now we're waiting. We've been recommended for a seven-year uh, renewal uh, out of uh, a possible 10 years of renewal. So uh, we're very pleased with that. Most schools, uh, when they come up for that first initial uh, renewal out of their five years, uh, you're really striving to just get another five years so that you can continue to get your footing and, and go from there. So uh, right now the recommendation is for seven, and we should have uh, hopefully some confirmation on that um, in the next week or so. So. Uh, with that, I think that's the last of my slides, and I think if I click again, then it's going to go to black. So uh, okay. instead of going to dark, I'll, I'll bounce it to you guys. What, what questions Wait, can I answer? Question? I was looking, I'm looking at page seven of your report, um, and just if I could just get some further explanation. It says SRCA improved the report card grade by double digits, plus 11. So what was the report card grade? What is it now? And is it good? I mean, I, I see it's 11. Yeah, I just, I, yeah we, it was a C both years. Uh, the, way that the, um, the way that the state report card is built, it's a 15-point scale. Uh, so we were uh, towards the bottom end of a C, uh, and then this past year we've moved up to the top end of a C. So we are sitting at a 67 uh, right now. So if we... Uh, move our report card grade up three numerical points, uh, then, then we would be in line for a B. Uh, what that means, you know, and the way that that report card is, uh, and I know it's going to surprise you guys having to deal with the state on, on different things, but there's a little bit of voodoo math involved. Uh, to get that report card, a part of it deals with uh, the proficiency of kids. Uh, part of that comes with growth. Uh, and then there's other factors that tie in there with that. But those are the, the two key factors. So uh, your, if your performance grade is moving up uh, in terms of the number of kids who pass the test, uh, and then also your growth, which means the kids demonstrated a year's growth or more, uh, that, that's how you, you move those numbers. Do, do, your, do the children there take the same test as uh, that all the other public schools take? Yes. Then? Okay. Yeah, we, as, a, as a public school, we are held... We are held accountable and responsible to the standard course of study. So the EOG test that all uh, three through eight students take, we would mm -hmm. take. Um, our Math 1 students are responsible for the Math 1 test that's given to high schoolers. Um, you know, we, we are held to the exact same testing standard um, as Haywood County Schools. Okay. And when you said that you were in the top 35 percent, does that mean that grade? As a school, and three, yeah. when you, I know there's a reference to being in the top 35 percent mm -hmm. of charter schools. Does that mean that that grade puts you in the top 35 percent of charter? Yeah, schools? our growth was in, in the top 35 percent of all the charter schools, mm -hmm. uh, and, and as well as all the schools, all the public schools, charter and traditional county schools. Okay, so when you say growth, what do you mean by growth? Number of students, quality of grades, rate. So, yeah, so if they were to score a uh, when we're looking at growth, what they are, the state provides us with a metric that kids are expected to meet each academic year. So when they meet that, that metric, that child is considered to have met growth. So we, we were able to move more students to that metric than 65% of the state uh, is what that means. And uh, if you look at growth measurables, um, 
you know, our growth ratio in reading, math, and science uh, for three through eight was all in the positive. Um, we're one of four uh, that were able to say that in Haywood County. Uh, the other, uh, there were three Haywood County schools that met that same criteria of having met or exceeded in reading, math, and overall. Uh, the other schools did not do that. Um, you know, they, they either um, fell short of those expectations in one of those three areas. Ryan, there's some of the, well, I'll talk to you after, after the meeting. Thank you, sir. Uh, absolutely. I just wanted to, uh, did you have anything? Okay. I just wanted to, uh, I, I know a lot of families that have children that go there and they're, they're really, they love the school and they love the, uh, you know, the, uh, the education their kids are getting and everything. And I have noticed that, uh, you know, sometimes you guys got, like you, you mentioned transparency issues. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, I know when I first became a, a county commissioner, uh, I didn't really understand the workings of being transparent. I mean, I, I, I wanted to be transparent, but I didn't mm -hmm. understand how, I could, how that can be translated and everything. So, um, so in 2003, we passed some board rules mm -hmm. that kind of kept us on track, and we've used those board rules since then. And mm -hmm. I think our, our board, I think for the most part, the media and everybody, uh, really the public at large, have, uh, have seen that it works very, very well. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just thought I'd make a copy of our board rules, and I, I had Candy made a copy, and I, I want her to maybe give you a, a, some of those. You might consider adopting some of those, if, if, or all of them. Uh, but I know it's really helped us stay on on target with transparency, especially on financial issues and uh, when we have our meetings, how we, uh, you know, like if we have something on the agenda, we, we usually, uh, if it's controversial at all, we don't vote on it or something mm -hmm. like that. Or if it's a public hearing, we don't vote on it that night. We put it off to the next meeting so we can get public input. It's just several things. And I thought that might be helpful because, uh, for, you know, to give you some guidelines. I know... Uh, and, and you might even think about uh, when you uh, when you when you do get additional board members, that's probably just well, probably parents or something, yeah. I guess. You know, because it's hard to get people to serve. But if you could maybe find elected officials that might be willing to serve that have experience, I think that would be real helpful to help you with the transparency and stuff. That's just some things I've observed yeah. um, in in watching you know you guys evolve and things because I feel like you're. I feel like you were me, you were making freshman mistakes yep. that were that you didn't really, you know, probably didn't want to make and probably, and to be honest, I didn't know how not to make those mistakes. Yep. And so our board rules, uh, Mark Swanger was a former school board chair and he, he came out with those and helped us. We all, we all kind of gave input on them, but he, he understood that from being on the school board and that really helped. I felt like you helped our, our board, don't you, Kirk? And, and Kirk's been... Well, I had some disagreements with Mr. Swanger about some of those rules, yeah. but <laughs> because I feel like we're here, we're supposed to be able to do our job. But <laughs> irregardless, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they they do help and and define the way we way we do business, and and the yeah. public can expect the way we do business. So, and and I think that's you know, and and part of what we've really tried to do, and and I, I absolutely want to take a copy of those and and yeah. look what we can envelop in with our own policies and yeah. and and also with our procedures, and and that was one of the things that we've really uh, really doubled down on in terms of, yeah. you know, one, recognizing, you know, you know we've made some freshman mistakes, but, uh, yeah. you know, mistakes are there to be learned from. Right. And, and when you take those and learn from them, uh, then then you can grow. And, and certainly, uh, you know, it's not a need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, yeah. You know, so, uh, you know, absolutely, you know, we're, we're looking to, to improve and, and grow from there. Okay. Well, Thank that'd, you. That'd, yeah, that'd be great. And then, like I say, we, you know, I, I think that's the only issue that I've heard complaints about with the school is just, you know, the transparency issues. Yep. And I think once you get beyond those, um, I think kids, you know, you're giving kids a great education and it, looks, it sounds like, you know, you're, you're striving to try to improve those scores and, and, and that's really important. And because uh, we, you know, I feel like we have a good school system. Mm -hmm. If we have a great charter school and we have a great community college, then Yep. You know, we've got everything covered in the county. So. Yep, absolutely. And, and, and I think that's one of the things in, in sort of going to how the, the, the charters are funded and how some of those monies pass right. through. Um, you know, it, it creates, it, it's almost built to create a little bit of animosity. Uh, and it really shouldn't be. You right. know, we're all, uh, you know, at, as, a, as a charter school and as Haywood County schools, we're all in the business and we're all in the, the interest of educating our kids. 
and, and the, you know that's that's our core objective. But the way that the the state's written some of those uh, funding laws, uh, that it has to you know basically uh, Haywood County Schools we're passed through for them uh, in terms of some of those funding things, and and it I. I I can understand why it creates a little bit of hard feelings, yeah. but uh, uh, we're all, at the end of the day, um, you know, we're all in this to, to educate our kids. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I just give my personal example. We, we, we raised five kids and uh, they, they were, they attended Christian private schools. Um, they attended, uh, ho we homeschooled them for several years and then a couple of them, we even went to the public school. So we, we, we always did what was best for our kids. And if, if, if the charter is best, for parents, and that's their choice. I'm glad that they have that choice in Haywood County, and um, and we just, uh, you know, and we have some private Christian schools in Haywood County. So, and of course, a lot of people homeschool. So, and then we have a great public school system. So, I think anybody that moves to Haywood County, they can have choices on how they educate their schools. And you guys are just another good piece of the puzzle for that. So, thank you. And Absolutely. does anybody else have any, anything? Just, yeah. just a quick comment. Thank you for coming this morning and giving us the report. Uh, you know, one thing that I'd like to suggest is maybe coming back more often uh, to give these reports because I think that's part of the transparency. You know, if you come, come, I don't know how often we can do it, but uh, uh, it gets the word out to the rest of the community what you guys are doing. I think that's great. Absolutely. No, I, I'll uh, put on my calendar. I'll, I'll work with uh, Brian. We'll, we'll get us on, on a recurring basis. Yeah, I told him before our meeting, I, I told uh, Josh, Joshua that we needed to have you be more, more often. often? Yeah, yeah. Because I think a long time ago, Ben, I guess Ben Butler mm -hmm. came, and uh, but it's been a long time. So yep. we, we, we'd like for you to come and, and just let us know how things are going. Absolutely. Okay. Glad to do it. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for coming thank, this morning. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And Candy's got that for. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I appreciate everyone's uh, patience in in the public comments. So we'll move to public com the public comment session. And uh, you have uh, three minutes. Each I have five people signed up, and you can speak for three minutes. And I'm going to keep the time. So when you, uh, when the t when my when my time uh, when my phone goes off, your time's up. And because uh, our our clock isn't working this morning, Candy was telling me so. Uh, and if you would just finish up your comments, I'm not. I, I don't really want to cut people off in mid-sentence, but if you would just kind of finish up your comments. I know last time we had some folks that went on for, for a couple more minutes, and that's really, you know, I just want to, you know, three minutes and and then and then we'll uh, be done. So our first, uh, and I'm just going to do these by the order that people signed up. Uh, our first speaker will, will be Robert Duell. And if you would just maybe say, state your name and maybe where you're from. Welcome. Good morning. want to hurt the speaker. Yeah, and speak into the mic if you would. There you go. Uh, my name is Robert Duell. Uh, I'm a resident of Haywood County um, and have been for the past seven years. Originally, I am from born and raised in upstate New York, much like Haywood County. Um, I joined the United States Navy when I was 17 during the Vietnam War served for eight years. I was a newspaper publisher for 60 years. I owned my own real estate brokerage for over 20 years. I left New York because of this. This is New York State's SAFE Act, Firearms Act. It's 101 pages long. And allow me to give you some of the highlights. One of the addendums states that you must pass a drug test to have a firearm license in New York State. You must possess a safe, a gun safe, in your home in order to own a firearm. You must have a hunting license in order to purchase a firearm in New York. You can only have a minimum, a maximum of seven rounds in any magazine. Any magazine that has the capability of having over 10 rounds is illegal in New York State. It cannot be possessed.
you must pass a mental health evaluation in order to get a firearms license in the state of New York. Your license to carry a handgun can be revoked at any time. If you are arrested for a misdemeanor, a liberal judge in New York can revoke your license and confiscate your handguns. The sale to an immediate member you can't give a gun to your child, your brother, your father, or your mother without going to a dealer and make them go through a background check. Uh, to purchase ammunition in New York, you're gonna have to go into a dealer and, go and be put into a database in New York. Assault weapons ban is um, also in New York, and that's very extensive. My, my point is, and I want to thank you for your work on your resolution. However, I don't think it goes far enough. A Democratic-controlled legislator, such as in New York, can pass these laws. They're simply backdoor gun control, and you don't want that to come to Haywood County. Believe me, people are leaving New York in droves because of this tyrannical legislators in New York. And the same thing can happen here. Like I said, I thank you for your resolution, but I just don't think it goes far enough. I really don't. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. Our next speaker uh, is Mary, Mary Thomas, or Tomes, Thomas. Welcome. You can just pull that mic down if you need to. Yes. <laughs> My name is Mary Thomas. I live in the Plot Creek Valley here in Awood County. I'm a re retired teacher and have been a county resident for 15 years. The January 21st meeting of the Board of Commissioners included a dynamic public comment session. I appreciate that everyone was given an opportunity to speak. I also thank the board for your comments. Mr. Long included in his remarks, the minority gets heard, but the majority rules. Mr. Rogers counseled for patience, quoting the proverb, haste makes waste. I appreciate it, Mr. Kirkpatrick's reminder that there are always two sides to every issue. Mr. Pless indicated that he made himself available to hear from all his constituents. Mr. Inslee, joined the other commissioners to emphasize they all took an oath to uphold the Constitution. Today's agenda includes a resolution declaring Haywood County a Constitution protecting county. I'm not familiar with the protocol for acting on the resolution. I am concerned that county citizens may not have had adequate time to respond to the previous protest and offer their own viewpoints. While there may have been a large crowd to speak in favor of a resolution citing concerns about a tyrannical government, there are more than 45,000 registered voters in this county. The North Carolina Constitution declares all political power comes from the people. It further establishes that government comes from the people and is instituted for the good of the whole. Government is us. It is not the enemy. 
It is difficult to remain impartial when confronted with the emotional response partially based on fear and misunderstanding. Our neighbors are not our enemies when they hold opinions that differ from our own. We are all Americans trying to form a more perfect union. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Phyllis Ahi. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak to today. Um, first, I just want to say hats off to her and Isaac and everything she said. Um, and I, I sat down yesterday, I'm not a speechwriter or a speechmaker, and I sat down yesterday and timed and wrote out this thing to read, and I threw it out the window this morning. Um, what we got here is we are, we're, we're, we're in the wrong place for the wrong thing. Um, I'm here to speak against a resolution because I don't feel, I don't, uh, feel that it's, we have a place that's speaking for a few and not, not the whole. Um, and I, I wrote this long speech. We heard from Miss, Miss Hale. Uh, she's a friend and, and uh, her, her, her points are valid. Their points are valid. I cherish my Second Amendment right too um, and my right to public safety. But this morning I woke up, and my children do this funny little thing. They're grown up now, and they say, they have conflicts and silly little arguments, and they say, Mom, who's the better child? Well, you know, that's not funny, is it? Um, and then I've even got a few I've kind of put under wing, and they say, oh, it's neither one of you, I'm the better child. Um, and that's kind of what we're looking at here. Um, we have, we're about, our constitutions are, should be rock solid. We shouldn't be hacking away at it or toying with it or questioning it or putting power in hands that we already have the power where it belongs, in the people. The government is the people. Do I agree with everything the government does? No. But there are the, our founding fathers set up the way to take care of that. And it's not mob mentality or or loud rule or vigilanteism. It's, it's just not. Um, we, we're presented with a conflict and both sides have, have valid arguments, passionate, valid arguments. And we're all scared right now, everybody is. Minorities are, um, women are, the LGBT community, um, religions, everybody feels right now that their, their uh, rights are being infringed on. And in some ways they may be, just at least equally to, to the Second Amendment rights, in my opinion. Um, but what we've got here is we're divided as a nation. It's a terrible time. We are terribly divided. And we're, we're setting forth a means to further divide us that basically has no solidarity in, in value. It just, it just puts a preference. It picks a child. It picks a favorite child, a favorite view. Um, I feel everybody in this room also has a favorite view or a particular passion that they're they're afraid of right now. They're fearful for. But it's not our place to, in Hayway County to speak for one. Um, or to, I don't even get what that is. What is a, a uh, Your time's about up. Yeah. Okay, well, I just want to say that we, uh, what were we before we were uh, constitution protecting? County. Thank you, Ms. Ahi. Okay, our next speaker is Paul Yeager. Good morning, commissioners, fellow citizens. 
The tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. It is its natural manure. Now, everybody, please take a deep breath. I didn't say that to call anybody a tyrant. I didn't say that to suggest that the time has come for anyone to be spilling blood. It is, however, emblematic of the spirit in which our country was founded. It is also emblematic of the spirit in which myself and others came to you two weeks ago to request your action to declare Haywood County a Second Amendment sanctuary. In two weeks, we went from what appeared to be a consensus of no need for action here, there's no threat, to a pretty healthy looking resolution. I'm kind of amazed. Until I look at the calendar, I do see there's an election coming. I know it might be more convenient to make this issue quietly go away before people go to vote next month. Actually, early voting in a couple weeks. When I review the resolution, I'm reminded of an old Wendy's commercial, which I'll paraphrase here. Where's the teeth? What I see when I read the now therefore clauses of your resolution is that you're dedicated to protecting my rights to the extent that folks in Washington, D.C. and Raleigh will allow you to. Gentlemen, that's not what we came to ask you for. Nobody claimed that you, sirs, were coming to take our guns. I don't know where that idea came from. What we're asking you for is your assurance that you will continue to act to protect the rights of citizens with your own power. I therefore urge you to table this issue, come back with a, with a better resolution, or at least have another meeting on this issue in the evening when more citizens can attend. I must leave now. I had to work until 11 o'clock last night, and I must work today. Please don't take my departure as a lack of respect for these proceedings or a lack of dedication to the cause. I know that the whole proceedings will be available on video shortly, and you can count on me to watch it, and you will hear from me. Thank you again for your time. Okay. Our next speaker is Marjorie Bogart. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Didn't realize I'd be talking after everybody talking about the sanctuary issues. <laughs> but I'm also talking about gun issues. I have a question about the legality of shooting a gun in my area. I've learned that you cannot shoot a gun in the town of Waynesville, but it's okay to do it anywhere in the county. I measured this. I live, my front door is about 75 feet from the county line. I live in the town of Waynesville. 75 feet from my front door is the county line. Another 75 to maybe 100 feet, I have neighbors, or I, I don't know who they are, people coming into that piece of land shooting a gun frequently. One Saturday, it went on for an hour and a half. They must have shot four to 600 rounds. It was constant noise. This is like 150 feet from my front door, closer to some other houses in my neighborhood. It's not far from the elementary school. I'm sure it hears the noise. What happens if it happens during classroom time? Are they gonna call for an emergency? It's also near where the new apartments are being constructed. I can, I can imagine they would all be complaining. If you look at what the rules are for Haywood County for commercial outdoor shooting ranges, they are as this. All shooting stations, targets, and firing lines must be located 1,000 feet from any existing occupied building. Access to the facility must be secured by a six-foot fence. We don't have that. Shooting ranges should be located a minimum of 300 feet from any property line. Gun noise shall be shall expect, expected to be with specified decibel range. Warning signs should be up that this is taking place. 
I think we need some rules in Haywood County as to distance. People are spreading further out of the towns. There's more homes near the county town lines. I think you need some regulations regarding distance from homes, other buildings, where target practice is done. The Saturday that it, they fired so many rounds, I could hear it hitting metal, and all I could think about was ricochet. There were young children there, 10, 12-year-olds. I would guess there were 8 to 10, maybe 12 people down there doing this. I was terrified, so bad that I sat in the back corner of my house as far as I could away from it, and I finally got in my car and left. I hope you will think about doing something to regulate the distance from a target practice area from homes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Ms. Bogart. Okay, that's all that I have signed up for public comment. Is anyone else, would anyone else like to make a public comment? Okay, sir. You would just state your name and where you're from. My name is Joe Allen James. Uh, I think we ought to give the resolution another meeting at night before you vote on anything to where people can talk to other people and to youngs about how this resolution is going to go. Number thing, another thing is she wants to make rules. Well, that's where this constitutional resolution you're offered to take a vote in. Just like you youngs is in the NRA, youngs have kids that shoots all the time. The rules on that, if you, to me, that's my right to shoot my gun. I'm sorry, ma'am, that's the way I feel. And, uh, but I do think that you and something else, Miss Howell, bless her heart, she never did say she was against the sanctuary. She was against about tighter rules and how to get guns and stuff. So I have seen the news make it bigger than what it was. Some people in Haywood County has made it bigger than what it is. But she never said she was against the Second Amendment sanctuary. No. But I think that you and commissioners, to think it out, let other people here in Haywood County talk to youngs, talk to other people, and wait till, the, till we can do a night meeting to make our decision on this. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to make a public comment? No, you, you know, if you already spoke, you can't. It's okay. Thank you, though. <laughs> I did let you go on. <laughs> Would anybody else like to make a comment? You know when I'll close the public comment and we'll move on to our uh, constituent concerns. And um, let's see, Mark, do you have any this morning? We're going to talk about it in a minute. Yeah. I've had a, a, okay. a bunch of phone calls, emails, texts, and visits, and uh, we'll discuss that in a minute. Uh, well, I did have one constituent concern concerning taxes, and I talked to our tax collector about it earlier. Uh, for everybody watching this and anybody in the room, uh, I had a guy that came, and I told this before. His name, uh, he has, a, there's about three people in Haywood County that has his same name. And uh, middle initial, uh, so on and so forth. Well, one of the people that has his same name is delinquent on his taxes, and they get their name printed in the newspaper about every year and so this guy that's paying his taxes on time and does community service and he's a very well respected guy he continues to get people chiding him and questioning his credibility and his integrity because they see his name printed in the delinquent tax listings so this is kind of one of those deals that's it's, there's really no win here i talked to the, <laughs> the tax collector and the way the statute is in the state of North Carolina, you have to print the name in the newspaper exactly how it appears on your deed. That's just the way it is. And then that name's attached to that address and that piece of property for further legal action. So I told the fellow I was sorry if he wanted to get his name cleared, he'd have to go to see a lawyer and get the name changed or go to the registered deeds office and get his full name or take his middle initial out or something to uh, change that mistaken identity thing. So I did get that straightened out. I thought that was kind of an interesting little quirk. Many of us here in the county have people have the same name as, as, as we do. I think there's three people in the county that has my name. 
bless her heart if I get phone calls uh, for a county commissioner. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> but we do apparently, you know, occasionally have these cases of mistaken identity that are legitimate, and there's not really a whole lot you can do about it. So I thought I would bring that up. Okay, yeah. Yeah, make sure, <laughs> make sure that person's that person. Ain't that right? Uh, I did. I had one, um, you know, on I-40, and I said this the other night at uh, – at the elected officials' reception at the Chamber of Commerce. So they remodeled the, or re revamped the uh, Welcome Center and the rest area on I-40 at mile marker 10 uh, near the Tennessee line, uh, and it finished last, I think, September. They finished with the construction, and I was at an MPO board meeting, which is a, a, a planning organization in Asheville that I serve on, and the uh, engineer for this division was telling us that the reason they haven't, or I guess WOS did a story actually, that the reason they haven't um, opened that back up is because they don't have staffing. I guess because the budget hadn't um, passed or whatever in Raleigh, which seems to me um, when you come into North Carolina, that's the first rest area that people people can stop up and get, and get information for, um, you know, whether it's you know, to get brochures for attractions that are in, in our area in Western North Carolina. So I was wondering if, if we could write a letter to our elected officials, if y'all, if there was a consensus to do that, asking them to staff. Uh, I think it's just tens of thousands of dollars. It's not that much money to, for, for, to where they'll properly staff that facility so it can get open. And, uh, and that's hung up in the budget process right now. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess that's what it is. It's, that's what, that's well, what might, Brian Birch told me. So. I might want to piggyback on that letter because there's some funds for the fairgrounds through the North Carolina Agricultural Fair line item in the budget, and it's holding us up down at the fairgrounds. We, we need that money, and it's laying on, on the governor's desk, and if, if we could just get those, I'll, I might piggyback on your letter okay. with, with that issue. If, okay. if, the only thing I'd just ask is just make sure that we know the facts about yep. it because it is, I mean, the visitor center is open it's just open in Maggie Valley, and yeah. it is staffed in Maggie Valley. In Maggie Valley, but the rest area is not. But but those people will go back to the rest area when the rest area opens. Right. So I think I, I don't know if it's just staffing or not because they they have that place staffed at Maggie, and those people that are staffed at Maggie, they're the That's, people that are going back. They've been displaced from right. that place. So no. I don't know if it's more people that they need to staff it or what. Janitorial. Okay. Yeah, I think it's like you know because they need, there needs to be staff there. You know, staffs there not during uh, during the night. So well, they that, said they have a lot of vandalism if they don't have. Some I staff. think Kirk's got a valid concern because I remember when the slide occurred and they closed I-40, they did move a lot of those functions to the the Maggie Valley TDA uh, center. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's where it is now. That's yeah. where that's where the yeah. visitor center's at. Yeah. So well, there's just the no signage center. to indicate that <laughs> to get off I-40 to go. Who, who would know? So. Yeah. But I think it's uh, anyway. I'll, I'll get the facts and to Candy, and if it's okay, and we'll we'll draft a letter and I'll, I'll send it to y'all and let y'all look at it for we. But I would like to ask them to. I, I just thank you for coming to North Carolina. You want to stop the rest area? It ought to be open when it's, it's fixed. You know, it, it's been remodeled and everything. So, okay. Which uh, that's I talked to Brian Birch with the DOT. He's the engineer head guy there. So. I will say one other thing. I had one constituent concern about the DOT. You know, all this kind of runs together since our okay. last meeting. We had a huge sinkhole occur on the county road, and I had a resident point it out to me. It had literally went under the white line, and driving by, you couldn't really see it. But if you'd dropped the wheel off, it would erect the front end of your vehicle and probably throw, throw you over the bank. So I called a local DOT, and they... Uh, they came out with a dump truck and took took about a half a load of gravel. It was straight down. I mean, if a person had been walking through there at night, he would just disappeared. You know, but they got that filled in and, and, and averted. So, you know, people call about things, try to take care of it. Thank y'all. Where's where, where that at? What road? It's on 215. 215 on the back side of the river? Right there on the, yeah. Yeah, right there at the intersection, 215 Sonoma Road. It's right below me, and I didn't even know anything about it. Actually, the neighbor called me and said, hey, did you see that? And I was like, okay. no, I didn't know. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all for all that. Um, okay, on the discussion adjustment to the agenda, I need to, we need to uh, 
have get a, an approval for a relocation of electrical lines at the Francis Farm landfill off off the waste in the perimeter of the landfill. And if it's okay, I'm going to add that to number seven of their uh, agenda, regular agenda, and, and a budget amendment for that so we can get that accomplished. And this is something we'd probably just have on our consent agenda if we, but we better talk about it. Okay, so I'll move on to our, does anybody have anything other for the discussion adjustment agenda? <coughs> Okay, we'll move on to our next order of business, which is our consent agenda. And the first item is to request approval of the January 21, 2020 special and regular meeting minutes. The second item is to request approval of the North Carolina Harm Reduction subcontract associated with the grant the Board of Commissioners approved at the January 6, 2020 meeting. And that's under attachment four. The third item of the consent agenda is to request approval of the budget amendment from the general fund, the state extension office for $8,249, which is fees collected for the family consumer science program. And it came in over, in over the budgeted amount and will be used for the program for the current fiscal year. And that's under attachment four. Does anyone have any questions about the consent agenda? I do on the uh, harm coalition thing. We don't have to do this today because this is just uh formality, I guess, but they're using some abbreviations in there to describe some of the participants and things like that. It would be really nice to know what those programs are. It's like the LED, LEAD, the SUD, and the ACTT. doesn't mean anything. I didn't see in there where it explained what those were, and I'd like to know kind of what those are and have them written out, and then we can talk about it later. Okay, do you want, we can get an explanation. Do you, Patrick, did you, do you know anybody? You can come up if you want to. What was it, Brian? Uh, I'm sorry, Mark. It, it's in their statistics on, on the people that they're helping. There's three of them. It's L-E-A-D, and then S-U-D, and then A-C-T-T. And it's talking about people that are referred that have accepted some form of, of treatment advice, and it doesn't explain what those are. Oh, okay. Uh, Patrick Johnson, Public Health Director for Haywood County, and I brought with me Lofton Wilson, who is the program manager for harm reduction. So LEAD is law enforcement assistance aversion. SUD is substance use disorder. Uh, what was the other one? ACTT. Um, uh, I think it's assertive community treatment team. It's like an intensive mental health treatment team that's out in the community. Okay, so these are all like peer counseling it's not people that are actually going into any kind of a treatment. It's just like a peer counseling where they can go to people and say, I'm having an issue and be guided through some of their addictions. Substance use disorder treatment, yes, is clinical treatment. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the law enforcement is just the sheriff's office or the jail system or someone that sends them to you to talk to them, or they have already consented to talk to you. So the, yeah, correct, the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program is a program that where we work with the Sheriff's Department and they connect people to us to connect them to treatment providers. Okay, and now how does the ACTT work? So that's a, another sort of community organization that we connect people to, um, and there's, uh, they're present in many counties across the state, um, but basically it's a team of treatment providers, some of them clinical, some of them peer support, um, so when people are having, I think, mental health crises in the community, um, it's a way to pr provide, you know, treatment and resources out in the community and hopefully especially to divert people from emergency rooms and things like that. Okay. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Any other acronyms that weren't clear? Thank you. I'm sorry for not including footnotes with those. It's oh, that's fine. Jargon. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you thank, all. Thank you all. Okay. Was there any other questions about the consent agenda? Here, here now, I'll uh, entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, any other discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 You want to oppose? <clears throat> okay. okay. So we'll move to our next order of business is a regular agenda. And when we, want, we have the first item of our regular agenda is to request approval of the county manager to execute necessary documents to contract with Piedmont Pharmaceutical Care Network for a cost not to exceed $150,000 per year. So, Brian, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I turn it over to Mark, uh, as you know, switching healthcare providers 
uh, one of the things that we wanted to build on was the disease management uh, for our employees. Uh, so uh, we asked Mark to help us evaluate uh, disease management provider providers. Uh, Piedmont Pharmaceutical Care is, is uh, a group that has uh, worked with probably 10 or 15 counties and cities in North Carolina, had some really good experience. Mark's here to show you an, an overview of our plan, but also the, the services that uh, the disease management will entail and how they'll work with not only our county wellness program, but also the new program we have at the hospital. So I'll turn it over to Mark. Thank you for having me this morning. Uh, the last time I was in front of you, it was a much more uh, difficult conversation. Uh, I'm glad to say this morning that it, uh, it'll be a much more pleasant conversation. Uh, discussing the health plan and some of the initiatives that we're uh, putting together. So on the second slide is just the plan performance for the current year. Uh, basically, the claims have improved. Uh, from a budgetary standpoint, we're in a positive position. Uh, as you may be aware, the plan was bid, uh, and there was a decision to make a change uh, to Aetna for the uh, 2020 plan year. <clears throat> and we anticipate a mid-single-digit increase, which, of course, is substantially better uh, than we were uh, this time last year. So when talking about wellness disease management, uh, what we're trying to target are the items and issues that are, that are significant drivers here within the county. Uh, weight, cholesterol, blood pressure, uh, all lead to diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So when you look at what the, the programs that are being put into place are trying to manage and help improve, these are the targets that we're trying to hit. So as the manager mentioned, uh, one of the vendors that we've worked with that's had a significant amount of success uh, across the state uh, is a group called PPCN, or Piedmont Pharmaceutical Care Network. Um, it is part of the overall strategy. Uh, there's more than just this as part of the engagement for employees, uh, but it is not a typical wellness strategy. Uh, it is a face-to-face -face, uh, interface with uh, pharmacist care managers. Uh, there's data analytics on both the medical and the pharmacy side to back up the strategies and to make adjustments. Uh, there's continuous engagement. Uh, as uh, the staff there likes to remind me, uh, it's uh, almost uh, never, you're never uh, graduated from a disease state such as diabetes. It provides incentives and accountability, so it's not just a stick. Uh, it's carrots as well, and again, it's designed to fit within what you've done on the employee wellness clinic and also what you're doing with the hospital's uh, fit together program. So the engagement includes uh, optimization of the medications. It, they work with their physician to help adjust the medications uh, if the levels qu aren't quite right for the member. And as, as a diabetic, you're trying to avoid highs and lows. Uh, it is an educational process in it, increasing the participants' knowledge of their disease state. Uh, and there are non-medication considerations. Uh, part of the education is nutrition uh, and exercise and lifestyle improvement. Uh, compliance, which is extremely important uh, for those that are hypertensive, high, high, have high blood pressure or diabetes, making sure they're taking their medications and, co and closing any care gaps uh, that they might have. So this is a uh, this is a, a reinforcement of what their physician uh, is working with them on as well. Uh, there's ongoing personal goal setting uh, and revisions to those goals. It's motivational. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit of, on, on a personal level. Uh, accountability, as we mentioned before, and weight management. So how are the, the, the how's the program measured? So it's engagement rate. That is how many uh, of the population are actually engaged in this process that are at risk. Uh, clinical outcomes and results, the medication optimization I mentioned earlier, um, participant satisfaction. So every year they do participant satisfaction surveys uh, and they get very high marks from the programs uh, that have been put in elsewhere. And then of course financial outcomes. Many wellness programs struggle to demonstrate fin financial outcome uh, and they do a fantastic job of providing you with the return uh, on investment. And I mentioned engagement. Uh, what this slide is demonstrating, if you look from the bottom, you're looking at groups that only have a year of activity with the program. At the top, you're looking at groups that have uh, three years or more. Uh, nearby, the city of Asheville uh, is engaged with PPCN. 
uh, as is the city of Rock Mount. Both of those have been over a decade in place. And if you look at the engagement rates on the top right-hand side, you're going to see 60, 70, 80 percent uh, engagement with the at-risk population. So not only do they, uh, it, is, uh, it is growth over time with the participants in the program, but they stay in the program because of the incentives, the support system that they're provided, and the outcomes for them at a personal level. This is the slide, if you look at the baseline column, this is where they started. So the, the high-risk population is uh, A1C of eight or greater. They started out on average at 9.7. Uh, the improvement uh, within the population, this is on a global basis, is down to 8.2, which is essentially a 20 percent drop. And even the not as, as high risk group of over 7 dropped from 8.7 down to 7.8, or a little more than a 30 percent reduction. For the diabetes program, you can see on the blood pressure side the improvement from uh, those that are less than, correction, over, uh, greater than uh, 140 over 90 uh, is up to uh, less than is uh, 80.1 uh, for the population that's managed cholesterol. Uh, LDL is in a great spot compared to the industry average for blood pressure. It's only 52.8 percent is less than 140 over 90. Uh, and you look at the improvement from the baseline to where this population is, and you've got over 1,000 participants in it. Uh, you're, you're seeing a consistent decrease in blood pressure, cholesterol, and improvement in glucose and weight. Um, for the cardiovascular population, blood pressure uh, is even better at 81.8 on average, less than uh, the 140 over 90 uh, versus the industry standards. Uh, and on the LDL, you're, you see an improvement from the 108.8 on average uh, down to the 105.5. Uh, and their, their A1Cs are also improved uh, as well, even though they may not be in the diabetes program. From a, from a medication adherence, uh, this information you see that in the yellow box of 77.1 is the average for the industry. This is the Blue Cross book of business. Um, and if you look at the 1718 results compared to where they went to, uh, in 1819, you saw substantial increases in medication adherence, which is very important to a diabetic population and a hypertensive population. The surveys that they get back, and so these are it's strictly the participants' uh, viewpoint on what they see and how they feel about their engagement. Uh, most of the responses are at the top, uh, almost 70% uh, at 10 out of 10, but then the remainder are either 9 out of 10 uh, or 8 out of 10. On, from a return on investment perspective, it usually pays for itself in the first year. We're still budgeting it as a budgetary item for to be conservative. Uh, but after year three and beyond, you're looking at three to one or four to one as the ROI for the program. This is claims data from uh, Cleveland County government, which has a high engagement rate, uh, has been in the disease management business for a very long time. Uh, and in the green circle, these are the members that are managed within the population. Their average claim was about $1,000 per member per, uh, per month. Uh, and the non, if you look at the non-managed population in the, around the red circle, you're looking at uh, almost five times, over five times the cost of the managed population. And this is taking claims data, both medical and pharmacy. Um, part of the educational process is to help the member understand what they're taking in and how it affects their body. So this is my information. Uh, and it, I was not trying to be perfect, but I learned a ton uh, by participating in it. And so what they give you is a continuous glucose monitor. You wear it, and uh, someone who's a diabetic probably is familiar with it, but for those who are, of us who are not, um, it is basically a patch you wear with a needle that sticks in your arm. They forgot to tell me that when they gave it to me. It's like, oh, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't, I, we weren't talking about a needle here. Uh, but it was really educational because uh, I've spent 40 years trying to take care of myself. Uh, there's diabetes in my family. My dad was a diabetic. He ultimately passed away from leukemia, and part of the problem was they couldn't treat him the way they wanted to because of his diabetes. Uh, and so you look at what's on here, uh, the first red circle you see is honey and coffee. Well, honey is supposed to be a good sweetener for you, but it spiked my <laughs> blood sugar. And I learned throughout 
uh, what, was a, what was happening to my blood sugar when I, when I was consuming it, and I made adjustments off of it uh, on what I consumed. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, I wasn't perfect, so I did eat the Captain's Fried Seafood Platter. Uh, I should have had a beer instead of the Sauvignon Blanc, but I'm a wine drinker. But it wasn't the height of the spike, it was the breadth or the width of the spike, and said, hey, Mark, you need some insulin. Uh, my favorite slide is the next one, which is the Krispy Kreme slide. Um, you know, uh, I grew up, uh, you know, you go out to the woods, you cut wood, you go out to hunt, you come back, you get a, a fried peach pie and a great knee high, because that's your reward for going out and, and exercising or ex exerting yourself. And Krispy Kreme donuts were part of my uh, growing up as well. And I'm not a diabetic, but I'm, because of my family history, I'm a slow processor. Uh, my insulin responds slowly. And so it took my blood sugar to over 200. Uh, and so it was really an educational process for me. This is what your uh, employees get. Uh, and they've got somebody to back it up and to help them understand and help them adjust. So. Any questions of me at all? Yes, sir. Mark, you need to go back to the previous slide. Yes, sir. Did you keep drinking more? <laughs> previous. Oh, white burgundy. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I forgot to tell you about that. Yes. <laughs> so that's my white burgundy alert. As, as I mentioned, I'm a, I'm a wine drinker. And white burgundy is basically Chardonnay, which is a dry wine. Um, I, I, actually, this is really, I appreciate you asking the question. It actually, alcohol pushed my blood, dry alcohol pushed my blood sugar down. And so one of my conclusions out of doing this is I could drink as much alcohol as I wanted to as long as it was dry or vodka or scotch, um, which of course, is, that's not true because it's not telling you what, what I'm doing to my liver. Um, uh, so I actually did, uh, subsequently in December, I did another one of these. It was an alcohol test. And it, I, I, it was not successful because I couldn't get my blood sugar up on what I was consuming. Uh, I have to re, I'll, I'll bring it to, to Bryant next time and we'll, I'll share it with him. Um, but it, it actually, alcohol has uh, a, a negative impact on your, your blood sugar if you're consuming the right alcohol. So I'm not a doctor, I'm not gonna recommend you drink a lot, but you can get away with it. How about that? <laughs> Frank would ask that question. <laughs> well, the Krispy Kreme's no bueno. Uh, that doesn't work very well. Uh, you, you have to you have to lay off the Krispy Kreme donuts if you want to, you know, maintain a decent blood sugar level. The thing that's beautiful about the continuous glucose monitor is, you know, when we put our hand on a hot stove, we know we just made a mistake. You slam it in the car door. Oh, that was not a good idea. That hurt. I'm going to go get my broken finger fixed. When you consume food, a lot of times you don't know what you're doing to yourself. You don't, you might feel a little bit like, you know, maybe I should have had that, those six donuts. I had two, uh, but I knew three would have been a really real mistake, but I didn't really feel it. But th what this does is it lets somebody who is at risk understand what's happening to their body. And it's 24 uh, seven. This, this technology is actually Bluetooth. So that uh, there are a lot of the participants in the program where they're, if they want it, uh, th their blood sugar levels can be fed directly to their pharmacist care manager so that they can watch and see what's going on with them as well. And there have been people who've been positively impacted by it, uh, seeing, you know, because as a diabetic, you're, you want to manage your lows and your highs. So you want to stay in a sort of middle bandwidth. And if you get too low, you can actually have, uh, you could pass out uh, from a too low of a blood sugar. And that's a big deal for big equipment operators. Was, one of them was a bus driver, so it was positively impacted. Any questions? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I enjoy in talking there. about it. Thank we, you. Uh, you know, I was just thinking about Krispy Kreme donuts. So you, you, when we were in Asheville, used to, I, I can't do that anymore, but if the hot donuts now sign was on oh, at yeah. Krispy Kreme, my car, oh. it went in there no matter what. And then it wouldn't leave until I got a dozen. So it was my car's fault, I think. That's right. So, oh, that's absolutely yeah. true. And then when I was a teenager, we used to sell those for fundraisers. And of course, I could eat a dozen then. So there's little bitty donuts, if y'all don't know that. But I think most people do. But anyway, that's, 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 this is interesting. And um, it really, I, I think if everybody, you know, 
looked at this, they could probably tell what they need to eat, what they should and shouldn't eat. So it's just great. Yeah, and it's not about being perfect. It's just trying to do right. better and better manage for yeah. your own. This, I, I, um, a lot of times we want to define this this strategy as a, a return on investment and in the economics for the county. Uh, in fact, what is even it, there are economics. There is an ROI, but you're actually it's more of an employee benefit and and health improvement strategy for your employees which are obviously very important to you uh, and you're giving them something that they couldn't necessarily get on their own uh, i mean and that's that's a to me a very big deal the the human aspect of taking care of your people and actually improving their health certainly i'd like to piggyback on top of your comments slide 13 here does indicate the end you know the economic benefit beneficial economic of this program you know, a healthy workforce is a better workforce. They're, you, they're not going to cost you as much on your health plan. And I know last year our program, our health program was the elephant in the room when it came budget time. So right. I appreciate Bryant and, and y'all's work on this. And it's not just about money. It's about better, healthier employees. I was out in public over the weekend and I had two, uh, two county employees came up to me and, and applauded us for starting this health initiative. And, uh, I was sorry I couldn't make it to the kickoff over there at the hospital. I had a previous meeting, but uh, they were just tickled to death that we had added this benefit for them. And this one lady was talking about how much better she felt because she was exercising and, and, and eating better and, and taking care of herself. And uh, she just thanked, thanked me till uh, I had to walk away from her. So just for you guys' benefit, you know, I think it's a big hit with the uh, with all the county employees that are participating in this and it'll, it'll help us with our health care uh, plan also. So thank you. Thank you so much. Is this voluntary participation or do we select the group that, that falls in this category and, and reach out to them to provide that? It's voluntary, okay. uh, com completely voluntary, but there is a, a carrot that if you get in the disease management uh, program, your your drugs will be free for the so that's the, the the kicker is that we you don't have to but if you do sign up we'll, we'll cover the cost of uh, the the diabetes and the cardiovascular medications do you direct them where to go so that's that's part of the coordination between jamie with the the hospital and uh you know a lot of the folks she's seeing they don't have primary care doctors so she's going to stay in, in that loop especially after the the blood work uh if they don't have a doctor she's going to she's going to help them get one and then follow back up saying oh now that you have a primary care doctor if you've been prescribed uh, these medications the county has another program for you to go in that, that you can get them for free um so we're trying to tackle it because, like uh, Commissioner Long said, the 37 percent increase year over year is not sustainable. We need to try to make progress where we can, and I think this is the right step. And then there is marketing uh, out to the population that, it, that is eligible for this, uh, but as I demonstrated in one of the slides, you're going to see growth over time of participants in the program because not only is it uh, direct outreach, but it's also uh, mouth to mouth, you know, it's uh, person to person, just like uh, Commissioner Long mentioned. Uh, people will start talking about what's going well for them and, and, and other people will join. Not everybody will participate because it is voluntary, um, but there are a lot of good incentives to get them engaged. Actually, I mean, I own a pharmacy and so, you know, one of the things that they do, some, certain things and certain criteria we have to follow based on the insurance companies and the drug companies is, is consultation. And it's the same type consultation that you're talking about. And if you don't provide that, then you don't get your, you don't get paid. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's similar. This is something that's ongoing in a lot of, a lot of different areas that they're really pushing and is to yeah. get people to follow back up, especially on their medications, that they mm -hmm. actually use their medications. Usually people get prescribed them and then they don't take them like they're supposed to. And we certainly know you know, the things that we're working on with the county as far as our, you know, the, what we eat and, and how we exercise are, are things, but also that they have to follow through with, with listening to their doctor and doing what their doctor says to do. Otherwise, you end up in worse shape. But. That's great. Do I have any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank great, you. Thank sir. you. Okay. So I, we need to... Oh, to okay, so I'll, I'll entertain a motion to request approval 
for the county manager to execute the necessary documents to contract with Piedmont, Piedmont Pharmaceutical Care Network. Cost not to exceed $150,000 per year. So moved. Your second? Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay. You want to oppose? Okay. Okay, your next order uh, item of the regular agenda is to request approval of Haywood County Fairgrounds name change to Smoky Mountain Event Center Incorporated and approval of amendments to the bylaws. And we have our Haywood County Fairgrounds uh, manager, Chris Caldwell, here this morning. This is under attachment six. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, sir. Just like to take this opportunity to update the board on what's going on at the fairgrounds. The office at the fairgrounds is now open Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., where in the past we were only open two days a week for four hours a day. We also have a part-time groundskeeper that works on average of 15 to 20 hours a week on the property. During the past year, we've made numerous improvements to the fairgrounds. We've installed security camera systems throughout the campus that we're able to monitor, via, monitor remotely via the internet. We replaced the gas heaters in both the Apple Orchard building and the Dogwood building. We, have per we purchased a new storage shed that we placed down at the Dogwood building to store our tables and chairs in. This past year, we also replaced all of the lights in the arena with the new LED lightings with the aid of the Duke Energy Rebate Program and the Haywood County Maintenance Department installed them on our behalf. <clears throat> we also had to repaint the Burley Barn roof. We had to replace and add new equipment to our concession stands. We also had to replace a damaged section of the underground drainage system that diverts water from the Apple Orchard building. And I'd also like to thank the Western Carolina Dog Fanciers Association. This past year, they donated six loads of river sand to the arena to help the arena surface in the drainage in the, in the property. <clears throat> We're still in need of a PA system for the fairgrounds. We feel like this is a safety factor. The current, uh, <clears throat> I apologize, the, the current approximate investment would be approximately $10,000. And also, if you haven't noticed the marquee sign out at the street, it's gone dark. That sign is no longer functional. It no longer works. We feel like that sign is vital to not only mark the location, but to let the, the, let the people of Haywood County know what's going on at the fairgrounds. The approximate investment to replace that sign would be $32,000. The event center has also seen considerable growth during the past year. We've added a monthly bingo that is on Tuesday night in the Apple Orchard building, which is a night that the building used to sit empty and dark. We also established an arena membership program to provide area equestrian riders a place to ride, train, and exercise their horses. We currently have a membership of 32 members. We also have had a substantial increase in the dog agility shows that are held in the arena this year. We're also beginning to see an increased interest in the event center from a number of national events that would like to come visit our beautiful mountains. We will be hosting the BMW Road Riders Association this year, and I just contracted with Kirby Farms out of Ocala, Florida, and they'll be bringing the Ghost Town in the Sky Six Gun Territory reunion show to the fairgrounds in June. We've also, in the past year, we've partnered with the Haywood County Animal Control to provide shelters for animals in need. Uh, and they know that at any time if they call me, we certainly will make arrangements to help them again. <clears throat> I'm here today to request that the board approve the amended bylaws to reflect a name change to our nonprofit organization. In order to improve the regional marketability and the perceived use of the event center by our local residents, we're requesting to change the name from Haywood County Fairgrounds Incorporated to the Smoky Mountain Event Center Incorporated. We're much more than a fairgrounds. We're actually a year-round event center, and we want to be the go-to place in Haywood County for future events. I'd also like to request the approval of two applications for our board, and we'll also be adding a sheriff's 
<clears throat> office representative as a liaison and community role. I'd also like to thank the Haywood County Maintenance Department and the Haywood County Board of Commissioners for their invaluable work in the support of the Haywood County Fairgrounds. Thank you. Um, just hang on there a minute. <laughs> so, uh, does anybody have any questions for Chris? I'd just like to call me and I appreciate Chris's hard work down there when I got, <clears throat> got elected. Uh, I, I was put, placed on this board and uh, he's done a fabulous job. <laughs> I think the bookings numbers have reflected that. He's a, a great marketing person, as you can see. He uh, works well with the public, and we're looking forward to, you know, changing this name to reflect, as he said, a more regional uh, venue, Smoky Mountain Event Center, and uh, our board unanimously uh, voted to do that. So, Yeah, and I've heard good things about you, Chris. I appreciate all the work you're doing. You came on right after I came off, I guess. And and so I, I thought Tommy would be a good replacement on that board with his farm and experience and everything. He, and, he's been outstanding. Uh, and I think y'all have hit the ground running. And, and uh, I, I go by that every day on my way home, back and forth to work, and I always see, see something going on. I have noticed the sign's gone dark, and uh, that, that sign seemed like it was good when it was there, but it was, sure was an aggravation because of the software and stuff. So it's probably good to get that replaced. I, I agree with you there. Uh, and then the PA system, we were talking about that long when I was on the board. And it is a safety issue, and, and it's, uh, I know I was there at the last, was it the last fair when we had the lightning strike, I believe. Yes, sir. That's correct. Yeah, so that would have been, you know, kind of good to have a PA system to maybe alert people to, you know, maybe get into the buildings yeah, and stuff. The, ca the county so. alerts us if there's a weather issue, but we have no way to alert the people on the grounds without some kind of PA system. Okay, great. Yeah, well, that's great. Okay, so does anybody have any other questions? How old is that, son? How old is the sign? How old is the sign? Yeah. I, mean, I, would think I, I didn't think it had been there that long. About but. 10, a little over 10 years. We've had a lot of problems. It, it? It, yeah. it is my understanding, and I have no way to prove it, that that sign was not a new sign when it was erected, that it was about seven years old, and it's my mm -hmm. understanding it's been there about 11 years. Okay. That sounds about right. Yeah, time moves by, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It really <laughs> does, yeah. Okay. You just think you see a sign there, and it's new, but it's not. Yeah. My only concern is, uh, as you expand the use, I get calls, and Tommy's aware of this as well, uh, every time that there's loud music every time that uh, the neighbors perceive that it should be stopped. Um, I would urge a lot of caution and maybe some building upgrades because these people that live next to it, some may have moved in, some have been here their whole life but we really need to address their concerns in as best we can because it's gonna make for a very poor partnership. They're gonna be calling us or whoever happens to be setting up here every time something happens. And before you get too far into the event planning, I'd like to see the noise addressed and have kind of a plan. And I know what, you know what I'm aware of. Uh, they stopped calling uh, several people that are on this board and I guess now uh, every time something happens, they call me. Yeah, well, they also call me, and any time there's an event down there, I do go down to the fairgrounds. The last event that was down there, I got a call at noon complaining about the music that didn't start till 5 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And I went down there, there was no music. There was another call at about 8.30, and I was actually standing in the parking lot, and I could not hear the music Mm -hmm. when the gentleman called. Mm -hmm. So we are doing everything we can. Uh, if there's a sheriff's deputy on site, they're, they're told that the noise ordinance says at 10 o'clock the mm -hmm. music has to stop or be contained within the building. Mm -hmm. They are working very diligently mm -hmm. to do that. I know at the last event they did actually have them turn the music off at 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. We are doing everything we can, but unfortunately that music does vibrate in that building and it does travel right straight up the hill behind us. Mm -hmm. And that's my I biggest would. concern is just, I don't know if involving them, and Tommy and I have talked about it, I don't know if involving them in, in some of the discussion might take some of that away, but it's kind of like you take a hammer and you hit your thumb and everything mm -hmm. you touch for the next two or three weeks, it doesn't matter how light it is, it creates a sore spot and right. you notice it. I think that's kind of where you're at now. There's been some things that have happened and unfortunately, I won't say they're listening for it, but they recognize it whenever those days come. 
and it may not be nearly as bad as it used to be. But somehow just involve them in this and try to, to do what you can. And I know you can't fix everything. Uh, I'm not going to be that uh, strict as far as my concerns. But just watch out for it and, and try to let them have a say a little bit. And I want you to succeed. I want you to grow. I think it would be great, the things that you're talking about. I think it would be wonderful. But a little bit of caution and, and maybe a little bit of their input. I would uh, just to address Commissioner Pless's concerns. Uh, I know Chris knows and the sheriff knows very well. That is why, if you look at the amended bylaws, we have added an ex officio non-voting member to our board, and, and that will be a sheriff's department representative. Uh, they will know the schedule, or the schedule of events, and they do enforce the noise ordinance at 10 o'clock. You know, and uh, so that is something we're very aware of, uh, Commissioner Pless, and we have addressed that in these bylaws changes. Yeah, and that, the subdivision that's above the fairgrounds was put in after the fairgrounds was there. So I think when people buy property there, they fairgrounds is, was there. And I know there are a few owners that have been there longer than the fairgrounds, yeah. but the vast majority of those, in fact, I did the subdivision in the, in the mid 90s. So uh, it's, it's, you know, it's the fairgrounds has been there for a good while. It's been there since 1990. So, but it, it's an economic driver really for our county. I know when we have some of those dog shows, they've had people from as far as Puerto Rico and uh, from uh, the Western states and things. So they kind of travel a circuit and uh, it really brings in, puts heads in the beds, if you will, uh, when folks come for that. So I appreciate yeah. your efforts in marketing the yeah, facility and, and we've had some great events. I know we, uh, well, I won't go over all those, but it, it, we've had some national events there, which is really tremendous. Just uh, maybe a, a comment and a question. Uh, I've been like the other commissioners. I've heard a lot of good things about you, Chris, and I appreciate the work you guys are doing. Thank you, sir. The only concern, I guess, that I would have or question would be, uh, I know any time you have a name change like this, it takes a, a while for folks to recognize it as a uh, event center versus the fairgrounds. Do you guys have anything in place to, or plan in place to uh, get the word out to folks? Well, we, we have just rebuilt our website which is much more user friendly and we're getting ready to change the name if you hadn't been on the Haywood County Fairgrounds website you need to go look at it it's entirely different I am working on a mail out uh, we already have a press release written that will be going out to name that and we won't just drop the name Haywood County Fairgrounds we're going to have to wean, wean people off of it what I the reason that I decided we needed a name change is I literally have talked to people that did not know there was anything that went on there but the fair every year. Mm -hmm. uh, the lady who is actually helping us with the website, who lives in Clyde, had never been on the property until she got an invitation to come to the monster truck show that we had this year. She did not realize that there was other things going on. Haywood County Fair will still be Haywood County Fair. It will not change a name. It will still be the F Haywood County Fair. So, yes, we, we will be doing some marketing to let everybody know that it's a name change and that uh, we're a year-round event center. And thank you for that. And also, uh, as the other commissioners have mentioned, uh, I've had the complaints as well that Com Commissioner Pless and uh, Commissioner Long have uh, spoke of. So I'm glad to hear that we, we have plans in place as well to address those situations. So thank you. Thank you. We don't have any other questions for I don't have any questions. I mean, as long as the people at the fairground are abiding by the law, just like everybody else, I, I don't see why they can't do what they want to do. Uh, it's like anything else we've been discussing in the last few weeks, so it's kind of strange to me that we're going to talk about noise. We talk about guns, and, but <laughs> guns, we, everybody's got to keep all their guns, and, but noise, we got to keep the noise down. That's just kind of strange to me. But, uh, but at any rate, as long as they're abiding by the law, I'm, I'm good with it. There's going to be places in Haywood County people don't want to live. Uh, they don't want to live there because they don't like what's going on. And, and unfortunately, we have out in the county, you have the right to do pretty much what you want to do as long as you abide by whatever laws we do have. So. Just shows it off it's just a little right? ironic to me. <laughs> do you make law, Kirk? <laughs> you we, don't make law, do you? No, we just I just go abide by. by. We just go by. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I'll entertain a motion that we approve the Haywood County. most of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll entertain a motion that we approve the Haywood County Fairgrounds name change to Smoky Mountain Event Center, Inc. 
and so approval moved. of amendments to the bylaws. So moved. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. That's unanimous. Okay, our next uh, item of the regular agenda under attachment seven is a request approval of the French Broad River NPO resolution in support of the French Broad Metropolitan Planning Organization's Regional Transit Feasibility Study uh, Phase One. And we have Chris Boyd here for that this morning. Welcome, Chris. Good morning, Chairman, Commissioners. Before you use the resolution requesting uh, approval by the French Broad River Metropolitan Planning Organization for a transit feasibility study. The purpose of this study would be to, to achieve a deeper understanding of existing needs, system conditions, and recommendations in order to coordinate efforts between transit providers in a regional respect. There is no cost to this to Haywood County. The MPO is providing the, the funding for this. Does anybody have any questions for that? I, I'm not going to read that. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> and it's in our packet. Okay, so I'll entertain a motion that we uh, approve the French Broad River NPO resolution support of the French Broad Metropolitan Organization Planning Organization's Regional Transit Feasibility Study Phase One. So moved. Was there a second? Second. Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor, of indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay. And that's unanimous. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Our next. Uh, item of business is to request approval of resolution declaring Haywood County a constitutional protecting county. And so that's in our, our packets. We, uh, let's see, we had, so we had uh, quite a crowd at our last commissioner's meeting. And we've all talked about this and we've all spent quite a bit of time. I'm, I, I will say that our staff has not spent a lot of time on this. Uh, I mean, as far as uh, the workings of it, the, these the, pretty much all the board members have uh, expressed an interest in this and and in, in creating it. Uh, I know we've had been asked to do a Second Amendment sanctuary uh, resolution, and that to me uh, is asking for us to violate the law, violate the Constitution. And we, I, I know, just personally, I swore an oath to uphold the Constitution, and that's what I intend to do, and that is to follow the law. And I'm not going to pass something that I, that I feel like breaks the law. Also, we see cities having sanctuary cities where they violate the immigration uh, and do not enforce the immigration laws, and that's wrong. So uh, we didn't want to go to this with the, the wording of sanctuary, and that's why, uh, personally, I feel like that's why we stayed away from it. So I'll, enter, I'll let you all speak to speak to this resolution. Brandon, I know you said you had a lot of calls and yes, uh, yeah, I've I think spent you probably more than anybody. I, I have spent uh, a lot of time in the last uh, several weeks on the phone uh, and, and in person as well. Uh, if you'd looked at my schedule in the last uh, several weeks, you wouldn't have thought that I had a business to run or anything else. Uh, uh, both day and night, taking calls, which I know that's part of it, and I appreciate the folks reaching out to me. Not complaining by no means, but it, it has consumed a lot of time and uh, I've heard both sides, you know, one's for it and one's against it. I've heard comments made last uh, in our last meeting. I've heard the comments made in the meeting uh, that we've had today with public comment. Uh, you know, I, I've heard the concerns about waiting until our next evening meeting when more folks can get here, uh, which I understand that, but at the same time, uh, I, I've heard from plenty. Uh, you know, uh, we, we've all worked on this, as Kevin's uh, mentioned, uh, on the resolution that we have before us, even though uh, I, I hear the debate and understand the concerns there that it don't have enough uh, uh, teeth, as was mentioned, or enough meat. Uh, I, I even tend to agree somewhat. Uh, however, I think, as you'll hear here today, uh, this board does not want to break uh, any laws and uh, that is a concern for this board as we work through this resolution. I know that our law enforcement and our local sheriff does not want to break any laws. He took an oath to uphold the law, and we as commissioners can't tell those folks what to do, uh, even though sometimes we may want to. Uh, we can't tell them what laws to enforce and which ones not to enforce. Uh, 
like I said, I know that there's a lot of debate uh, in the last several weeks, even goes back a little further than that, when I started having conversations with folks uh, as far back as last year, I guess uh, in early December, it seems like it's when the steam picked up. And I personally, as Kevin uh, has mentioned, uh, have spoke to a lot of people concerning this as more counties started to roll in to doing gun sanctuaries uh, along with constitutional resolutions. <clears throat> uh, what I will say for the resolution that we have before us today, uh, in the wording that I know that a lot of folks are disagreeing with, I want to share with you that same wording is in a lot of the other uh, county resolutions. Stokes, Surrey, McDowell are a few, and there's many others that, that has the same type of wording that we do in our resolution. And uh, basically, uh, it, it boils down to, uh, uh, in the whole scheme of things, uh, that we'll be looked at as passing a, a resolution to defend our rights, our constitutional rights. Uh, if you notice in the news, uh, the news are reporting that it's not what the wording actually is, even though, again, I probably would like to have a little more uh, uh, firmer stance myself, but uh, it's not in what the wording says as much as it is how many counties are passing these uh, resolutions. As I mentioned before, I'm a big Second Amendment supporter. I'm not going to spend, you know, five or ten minutes going back over what I said in our last meeting, but uh, I, I have always... Uh, said that I will defend our Second Amendment rights uh, and do whatever I feel is necessary to do that uh, in respect to the others that are against it. However, I understand that if we did change the wording, as I have talked to many constituents, uh, that, that I, I do know that our federal and our state laws will trump anything that we do. I mean, we can pass an ordinance, we can pass a resolution, and at the end of the day, that, that doesn't really uh, hold water, so to speak. Uh, we can take that stance, uh, but, but again, we will be trumped by that federal and state law. What we have to remember, those of us that are for those rights, is that the real fight is going to be at the state and the federal level. And I'd encourage each one of you guys out there that, that, that believe in our Second Amendment rights that you go to our our representatives at the state and the federal level and share your concerns. Again, I feel like we're going to do all we can at this level, and I think after discussing this with this board up here that we're all in agreement of that. Uh, as I said, uh, it may be a hard thing to do to go back and change the wording on the resolution that we have before us. But what we can do is pass this resolution and join 23 other counties. There's right now, unless something's changed and over the weekend, there's 23 other counties uh, that, that have passed such resolutions. And uh, I think that that, along with others that are in line, as long as they do that, is going to send a strong message to our legislators. And like I said, at the end of the day, what we do here holds no water, but sending this message to our representatives is what's going to speak, uh, speak volume. Uh, for example, if, our, if we pass this, we have other counties that pass this, our legislators that are fighting for these rights can go, uh, go out and say we've had X number of counties that have passed resolutions. They're not necessarily going to go back and read our wording or look at the wording, but they'll say X number of counties have passed such resolutions. If we have 85 out of our 100 counties in North Carolina, that, that speaks volumes, and it's going to send a bigger statement across our state. I know that the resolution that we have <coughs> uh, before us today and that we've put together as a whole, I think most of us have had input on this and uh, have argued over several of the points that's on here, uh, but all of our constitutional rights are highlighted in this resolution, especially the Second Amendment. If you'll notice in the resolution, the Second Amendment is the only one that, has, that is specifically mentioned. And uh, I personally uh, wanted to have that in there because the Second Amendment is the reason that we have a guarantee that our other rights are secure by allowing our citizens redress against a tyrannical government. And so I feel that our Second Amendment right is what gives us the, the defense against the other rights that I'm for as well. 
even though this is only a constitute or this is a constitution protection resolution the second amendment or the right to bear arms is the only right that we specifically mention as i said again uh, as commissioners uh, i want us and i want the public to keep in mind that this resolution is only symbolic but it does send a message to washington raleigh that we won't stand for anything that uh, infringes upon our rights and, and I, I want to read an email. I'm not going to tell you who it is, but uh, I may have to put my glasses on here. Uh, this is kind of what I've heard in general. As Kevin said, I've talked to many, many people, and this is kind of the message that I've got. I, I was actually at the shooting uh, competition that the schools put on this past Saturday, and I uh, pulled up, and I was amazed at how many people were there. And uh, uh, I thought it was great to see all our kids involved in those shooting clubs. I mean, I, I don't know how many people was there, but two fields were full, and there was kids from our middle schools, our high schools, and even kids outside the county. Uh, even one of the comments was made that with all those guns around, you know, none of them kill nobody. You know, uh, it all goes back to what we all know and what we talk about. It's not the gun, it's the person. But anyway, I had several people come up to me at that meet and, and shared this same uh, same message, and I want to read this to you. It says, thank you for the diligence and work on the resolution declaring Haywood County a Constitution Protection County. While most of us Haywood County citizens know this is a symbolic gesture, we also know that symbolism has real and important meanings. He goes on to give some examples. But he said, the meaning behind the resolution that was released on Friday, January 31st, is clear, precise, and sends a very strong message to state and federal government that we will not support any proposed law that infringes upon our constitutional rights and places the perfect amount of emphasis on the Second Amendment. I, as a private citizen, fully support the resolution declaring Haywood County a constitution protecting county and ask that the Board of Commissioners show a unified front and vote unanimously in favor of the resolution. And he goes on to say some other things. But again, this is the message that uh, seems like I've heard more, more than, than others about waiting or putting more teeth to the resolution. And uh, I, I would have to say that uh, after thinking about this and pondering on what to do all weekend long, that, that I tend to agree. Well, uh, <clears throat> I want to address a couple, three comments that was made by public speakers here today. And I think I made a comment to one of the uh, reporters here on Tuesday night a couple of weeks ago. This kind of reminded me of a Tuscola Pisgah football game. I mean, this place was packed, and we usually don't have this many people here today. So it is a, a very impassioned topic. And uh, I had some typed out remarks last time, and thanks to getting old and having to use uh, reader glasses, I lost my place two or three times, and it kind of broke up my my thought train. So I guess I'm going off, off script here this morning, which is okay. Uh, Ms. Thomas, I appreciate you coming and all the ones that spoke, the military veteran that spoke this morning. We appreciate your service uh, to our country and protecting our country. But Ms. Thomas made a comment that I, I was quoted to say in the morning, minority gets heard and the majority rules. I did say that. And I think that's one of my points where I kind of lost my place. That is a foundation for Robert's Rules of Order, which we operate by. We are sure to allow the minority in any discussion to be heard. Uh, without fear of uh, repercussion, and we did that. And there were several people here spoke against it. And, uh, you know, but the majority here, was I was referring to, is the five here. Uh, three votes here will pass anything, just three. And, uh, of course, there is times to go after that one lost sheep, uh, the 99, and, and leave that and go for the one. And, and there's times to do that. And so I, I, I wanted to make myself clear on what I was saying. I wanted to make sure that uh, we adhere to Robert's Rules of Order and allow everyone to be heard. And then uh, after much discussion and getting all the facts and the consequences, uh, we come up and we, we vote. And the majority here will rule. So uh, having said that, I, I want to address Ms. Thomas' comment there. And also uh, another comment, uh, there was a question about the timeline. Uh, maybe questioning our integrity on moving on this. And I'm glad we've got a video camera here. Uh, I've been on this since January 2019. 
by virtue of being on the North Carolina County Commissioner's uh, group, I went to Raleigh in January. For some reason, I got put at the table with some commissioners from Cherokee County, and that's what they were talking about. And uh, very interesting discussion. As you know, they were hot on it. They moved the resolution in their county in March. I know these guys by first name. I was actually in Cherokee County a month ago yesterday. My wife and I went to an event out there. I talked to those folks. Even the guy that crafted that resolution, I talked to him. And uh, so for you to think that we're being spurred by a movement, you can forget that. You know, these fellows right here are level-headed. We're going to take all things into consideration and, and move at a good pace. Uh, one of my fellow commissioners told me early on, he said, good government is a slow government, especially when you don't have to act in an emergency situation. So in gathering all this information and everything, I think we've come to a pretty good conclusion here with this resolution. Uh, I, we didn't act in two weeks. I actually was sitting here up here the other night and I personally had a, the bulk of a, of a resolution about 80% complete. I had been sitting on for some time. I told these fellas back in June, I said, it's coming. I think they'll agree. I mentioned to a couple of them, this movement's coming to us real soon. We're going to have a courtroom full real soon. And so we've been very familiar with this. I've had discussions with the sheriff. I've had discussions with other people all during this time. And so for you to think we did this within two weeks is just baloney. Uh, we've been working on this for some time. We've been thinking about it some time, uh, thinking it was coming. So uh, having said that, I will address that inference uh, that that's not true. Uh, we've been looking at this and uh, for some time. Also, uh, Mr. Duell that spoke about gun control in New York City, or New York State, excuse me. Uh, they have some very strict gun rules, but for you to come to the commissioners here and, and put your trust in us to be able to pass law that restrict, or red flag laws, that's gonna restrict your magazine capacity, uh, background checks of that nature, you've got some misplaced uh, thrust here. You need to go to the State House in Raleigh with the state rep representatives who make law and your uh, U.S. representatives in Washington, D.C. Uh, when they pass a unconstitutional law, you can Google it, the courts get bogged up, nothing happens, there'll be somebody appeal it, it'll wind up in the Supreme Court for them to make a ruling on. Uh, so I talked to a state representative over a month ago about this. And the representative I talked to basically was just passing the buck. Well, why don't y'all do something at the county level? And I said, well, I'll have to put it through committee. I might get the Speaker of the House to bring it up. And I mentioned about three states that had passed one of these. And I said, why don't you go ahead and do that? Uh, you're the elected official to cover North Carolina. You can save all the pain and suffering for all the counties, the 100 counties in North Carolina and all these uproar meetings. And, uh, oh, well, if you'll do this, you'll do that. I knew real quick that they was wanting us to do their dirty work for us. And I agree with Mr. Mr. Rogers, yes, we can pass that word on up the line and make a statement that, yes, we stand for the Constitution, the Second Amendment being part of it. And so we're going to try to do that today or we're going to bring it to a vote. So, uh, yes, uh, I encourage you, if you will notice, how many of you have read this resolution in total? Would you raise your hand, please? Very few. Very few. I would recommend you read it in total. Our, there is two emphasis in this resolution. One is the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment is the hinge that all the Constitution hangs on. It gives people redress against the tyrannical government. The other emphasis in this resolution is voting. The founders of our Constitution knew that the power was within the people. Your power is in your vote. You don't like your state representatives, go vote them out. You don't like these commissioners, go vote them out. You don't like your U.S. representatives, go vote them out. But you better be careful when you do vote them out. You better find out what you've got. If you've got a good constitutional believing representative who's going to go with the Constitution and follow the laws of this country and this state, you better keep it. So that's where the power lies. It's reflected in this document. There's language for two sections of the Constitution. The Second Amendment, if you'll notice, it is the only amendment that is written out in toto in this document. 
We mentioned all of the, all of the uh, Constitution. I'm very proud of that. We're not going to discriminate against the Second Amendment or the other people that do not come up here and, and talk about the Second Amendment. We believe in the whole document. So all of the amendments, all 27 of them, core of the document, terrific document, terrific. Article 1, first three sections enable us as citizens to vote our representatives in. That is where the power lies within the people. That's the power of the Constitution. And all the civil rights, all those things are included in that that we're added to later. Two sides of this. And the misinformation surrounding this has been absolutely mind-boggling. The misinformation floating around on both sides. It's been mind-boggling to me. One group says, we're going to take your guns up. That's hogwash. I talked to a couple of guys I work with. By the way, I'm a, I punch a clock. I'm a blue-collar worker. I go to break rooms. I had some guys say, well, I said, what do you think about this? They said, we well, don't care what you think about it. I said, really? What do you mean? He said, you ain't taking our guns up. He said, just come and try it. I said, well, I'm with you. You try to take, somebody tries to come and charge my house, take my guns up, I'll shoot all my bullets and I'll throw the rocks in my driveway and then I'll shoot you with a water pistol. That's the way most of us are here in this county, right? Most people say, well, we don't care what you do up there. <laughs> That's the spirit, right? That's the spirit. That's what makes this country great. The misinformation is we can do something about, we're going to change your background checks. I had multiple emails, people scared to death that this is going to be a Wild West shootout county. There'll be no background checks. There'll be unlimited magazines. I mean, you just wouldn't believe it. I, did any of you get any of that stuff? So we can't change those laws. Go vote for your state representatives and your federal representatives. That's where they're, that's their job, not us. So the other side, trust me, we're not going to take your guns up. We couldn't if we wanted to. We couldn't if we wanted to. I, you know, I, I don't even have a pre-played burial plot. I'm not, I, you know, I, I'd like to live a little longer. I'm not going to try to come take your guns up. <laughs> so that's not going to happen. But this resolution, I feel, is a comprehensive resolution that covers the whole Constitution. It is heavily tilted toward the Second Amendment and encouraging you to go vote. The final two statements, go vote, and it implores our U.S. Our US representatives and our state representatives to not change the Constitution or do anything that's infringed on any of our rights. And the Second Amendment's included in that, guys. The Second Amendment, it's included in that. So, uh, Someone said, well, we'll just vote you out. I told them, I said, if you want to vote me out, that's fine. I serve at the pleasure of the people. I, I'm not, you know, I'm not special. Vote me out. But when you do vote somebody in that's going to cater to your side of it, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to vote you in a crook. Oh, what do you mean? I said, when I put my hand on my father's Bible and I took the oath of office, and it's spelled out in this resolution. Basically, there is one section in there that says we reaffirm our oath of office, that we will uphold support the United States Constitution and its laws. We will uphold the North Carolina State Constitution and its laws. Folks, elect yourself some lawmakers that will enact law that's constitutional, and you won't have to worry about it. The sheriff took that oath. He explained that the other night. We all took that oath. You're going to have to find somebody to elect that will not put their hand on the Bible and take the oath of office. Is that clear? My 19-year-old son, this is a real good one right here. I called the North Carolina State Association of County Commissioners and I asked the director about it. And he said, well, you know, maybe y'all could put your hand on the Bible and take your oath of office again. He said, surely if you take your oath of office twice, you'll defend the Constitution twice as hard. <laughs> I told my son, I said, maybe that's what we need to do. Maybe we just need, because there was nobody here when we took our oath of office. Hardly anybody heard what we said we would do. And my 19-year-old son said, I wouldn't do it, Dad. I wouldn't do it. He said, all you're doing is admitting 
that you've been lying for the last year. <laughs> but you hadn't been doing that. So when I said that the other night, I said, this is hard for me. Maybe I wasn't very clear with that either, Miss Thomas. When I said, this is very hard for me, it's hard for me to call myself a liar. It's hard for me to go ahead and do something again that I've already done. I took my wedding vows, I told my wife, and she took, she gave my, me her vows. Some people redo their wedding vows. I mean, I've often wondered about that. I mean, that's okay if you want to do it, but are you saying you didn't really mean it the first time? <laughs> and honey, I love you too. I'm sorry for bringing you up. <laughs> but I think I'm about through with the with this, uh, we're not a little off script, but uh, that's my feelings, that's my thoughts. I think we have a great resolution. It covers the complete Constitution. It covers the complete Constitution. And don't let it, don't be fooled. That Second Amendment is the hinge pin that the whole thing hangs on. It is. It's the hinge pin that makes us a free people and ensures that we won't have to fall under a tyrannical government again. It ensures that the Constitution will be followed and we'll get to vote. That's where the power is. So thank you. I, I, I pass my time on down the line if anybody else wants to share on this. I've, I've reviewed this and I don't have any, any problems with it. It, it upholds the, the oaths that I have taken, I don't even know how many times, four or five, five times. And, um, and it doesn't uh, violate uh, any rules, doesn't violate any laws, uh, and it doesn't put Haywood County in jeopardy. And that, that was my, my, my primary concern was placing Haywood County in, in jeopardy by making some type of stance that, that was in violation of, uh, of a present law or future law. So I'm good with it. One part of the resolution says, whereas the right to vote by citizens is guaranteed in the Constitution, and free and fair elections are essential for we the people to have government by the people. When we were in here the other night, my emphasis was on vote. Talk to your representatives, let them know what you think. Michelle Presnell, I've spoken to her on numerous occasions. She's completely in support of the Second Amendment. I spoke with Speaker Moore on Friday. He is completely in support of the Second Amendment. Both of their advice, go vote for people who believe the way that you do, and you have nothing to fear. If we don't vote, we have everything to fear. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, thank you Commissioners. Um, and I, I also spoke to several law enforcement uh, folks that uh, are, have had high positions, and they are... Uh, they were uh, appreciative of uh, that we don't uh, try to violate our oaths by saying that we're not going to do something that, that we're constitutionally bound to do. So I appreciated that. And this does affirm our oath, so. Uh, does somebody want to read this or do you want to? What do y'all think? I? I don't care, whatever you want to do, I'll read it. Uh, if you want me to read it, I'll read it. Okay. I do, I do, I, go ahead, Kurt. Let me get back, let me sign back in to my laser fish. Oh, here you go. <laughs> timed out. I timed out again. Here you go, Kurt. I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it right here. Got it, if you know, maybe read. You, well, go ahead. All right. My you got it? You ready? All right, resolution declaring Haywood County a constitution protecting county. Be it known that <laughs> After over 230 years, the United States of America continues to be the longest ongoing constitutional republic in the world. Whereas our founders fought, bled, and died for independence from a tyrannical English government that imposed its will on and extracted taxes from its people without representation. And whereas being aggrieved and repressed by the English action, this nation declared its independence on July 4, 1776. And whereas, after gaining independence, this nation adopted as the supreme law of the land the United States Constitution, which is the basis of this miracle of America. And whereas the Constitution's opening phrase places power in the people of these United States by stating, we the people, and sets rules and parameters for 
I, for a three-branch form of self-regulating government. And whereas the first 10 amendments, known as the Bill of Rights, were adopted with the stated purposes of extending the ground of public confidence in the government and to, be, and to best ensure the benefit, beneficent, beneficent ends of, this institu of its institution. Whereas 17 other amendments were later adopted, and whereas in present and past times the Constitution has been and is under pressure and attack from foreign and domestic entities, and whereas freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of, of religion, rights to peaceably assemble, rights to due process under the law, and a well-regulated militia be necessar necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, are rights preserved in the Bill of Rights, and whereas the right to vote by citizens is guaranteed in the Constitution and free and fair elections are essential for we, the people, to have government by the people. And whereas equal rights for men and women and civil rights for all citizens, regardless of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin, are secured by the Constitution and the laws enacted pursuant thereto. And whereas all rights contained in the United States Constitution are held in the highest esteem and protected by Haywood County. And whereas the Haywood County Board of Commissioners recognizes that the Constitution's Second Amendment guarantees that these rights are secure by allowing its citizens redress against tyrannical government as witnessed by our nation's founders who crafted the Second Amendment. And whereas citizens deserve the right to keep and bear arms if they so desire for self-defense, the defense of others, protection of individual liberty, and for the preservation of a free state as guaranteed by the United States Constitution. And whereas the Haywood County Board of Commissioners are in opposition of any proposed law that infringes upon our constitutional rights, specifically the Second Amendment, but not inclusive to it only, and will use all legal means necessary, including the withholding of funds, in order to guarantee our citizens the protections afforded under the Constitution, so long as said action does not violate either the U.S. and North Carolina state constitution or any federal or North Carolina state law. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Haywood County Board of Commissioners declares Haywood County a Constitution-protecting county by affirming our oath of office to support and maintain the Constitution and the laws of the United States and the Constitution and laws of North Carolina not inconsistent therewith. Be it further resolved, the Haywood County Board of Commissioners oppose any efforts by any entity to infringe on or take from the Constitution. This will include any measures necessary and legal, including the withholding of funds, so long as said action is within the bounds of the United States Constitution, the laws of the United States, the North Carolina Constitution, and the laws of the state of North Carolina. We declare that Haywood County government will use all its powers to defend and protect the constitutional rights of its citizens. The Haywood County Board of Commissioners implore all its citizens to exercise the right to vote in elections as guaranteed by the Constitution of the United States of America. The power lies in we, the people. The Haywood County Board of Commissioners implores the North Carolina Legislature and the U.S. Congress to use all its powers and authority to protect our citizens' freedoms under the Constitution of the United States, to reject any proposed law or regulation that will infringe, may infringe, or place any burden on the Constitution of the United States and its citizens. Let it be known, Haywood County, North Carolina, declares itself a constitution protecting county adopted by the Haywood County Board of County Commissioners this the third day of February 2020. Any other discussion? And that would be my motion to approve. Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay, you don't want to oppose. Okay, that's unanimous. Thank y'all. Okay, our next item of business is to request approval to set the advertising date of March 25th, 2020 for the 2019 delinquent real estate taxes. And we have our tax collector, uh, Greg West, here this morning. And that's under attachment nine. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I'm here to request approval to set the advertising date of the 25th day of March 2020 for the 2019 delinquent real estate taxes. Uh, the collection, tax collector is required to advertise delinquent taxes through North Carolina General Statute 105-369. And, and then you have your report attached here also yes, sir. that you're required to do. Yes. So you've got, okay. As of uh, January 6, 2020, that was the last day to pay your taxes without there being any penalty of interest. The county had a remaining balance of $6,210,191.86. We had a collection rate of 84.52%, and we've had a lot of changes since then. 
but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd imagine so. What's the last day that you can pay your taxes without getting them printed in the yeah, paper? Thanks for that. It's probably going to be sometime around March 20th, 21st, something like that. We'll be working with some. the newspaper. I'll have to get them the file around that date, and then we'll work. Someone comes in between then, we'll be past, you know, getting that name to them to have it retracted out. Okay. You still got about six and, weeks. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we'll be mailing the delinquent notices. Uh, around February, mid-February. So those will go out reminding people that, uh, you know, they need to get that taken care of. And um, then if not, then the paper. Now, we hate putting it in the paper. Uh, Tommy and I talked about that. Uh, you know, I believe last year there was a Greg West owed five bucks in the paper there. So I, I got a few phone calls on that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's bad. I should have. <laughs> it's bad if you're the tax collector or you're, or you're or a commissioner or running for commissioner and other taxes, is it? That's it. <laughs> so. Yeah, okay. All right, so, all right, so, does anybody have any questions or comments from Greg? Appreciate the job you're doing, Greg. Thank you. Okay, I'll, re I'll request approval to set the advertising date of March 25th, 2020 for the 2019 delinquent real estate taxes. So moved. Okay. Second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you, you. Greg. Okay. Our next uh, order or item of, of the regular agenda is to request approval of appointment of Tracy Wells as the clerk to the Board of Haywood County Board of Commissioners. So, where's she get? Try back. <laughs> she always <laughs> hides. She's hiding <laughs> behind to where I can't <laughs> see her. Uh, <laughs> Like Waldo. So anyway, uh, we we have uh, Candy is is going to be retiring uh, her last official day is February 14th, and uh, we're having a reception for her after the meeting right behind here for her if anyone would like to come, and we'd like to come by and see her before February 14th. And Candy, we appreciate uh, the reason Tracy's stepping into this position is because Candy is retiring, and she wants to spend some more time with her husband John. And uh, he, uh, he's uh, got some health issues. And so uh, Candy's like me. She, we spent a lot of time at the VA hospital, <laughs> which is a great facility. So um, we, and we appreciate your service, Candy. I think you've been here six years for the commissioners. And then before that, how many years with uh, DSS? 15 total. OK, all right. So, so we do want you to spend time with your husband. And uh, I know that that'll really be appreciated by him. And uh, but we appreciate all the hard work that you've done. The clerk to the board, if you all don't know, keeps us straight because there's a lot of laws that we have to follow. And so it's important for us to uh, to follow those laws. And uh, be before we do the vote, I want to present something to Candy. So if you want to come up there. So we got you a gift for from from the county, <laughs> and oh, which is a clock. So, cool. so you might want to. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate this, that. So they can put that on camera, and uh, Ryan can Ryan can zoom in on it and stuff. So, but that'll be a memento that you can put up oh, on the wall. And you probably don't want to be. You probably don't want to be. Uh, Thought, think of us much, but no, <laughs> it's no, tough. So. I appreciate everything. Okay. I've really enjoyed my years. It's been a great time. Perfect, great boards to work with, and it's just as complicated as the job is. It's been very easy. So all because of everybody that I work for. Yeah. Okay. Appreciate right. that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Best wishes, Candy. <laughs> I know you probably can't wait. <laughs> okay, so in order to, so we appreciate Tracy. You know, take, they have to take classes and pass classes, right? And uh, to be the clerk to the board. And they, you know, there's certain laws that we have to follow, and nobody can know every law. But the clerks are 
are trained to know those laws as pertaining to the Board of Commissioners and things. So uh, they have, uh, a clerk has sites that they put things on and websites and things to keep everybody, uh, you know, updated on what they're doing. And the clerks all work together throughout all the counties. So if they needed a resolution on a Second Amendment thing or something like that, she can call the clerks and get that. So there's a lot to being a clerk. It's just not like you can go hire somebody and they can come in. It's not, Tracy's not, I mean, Tracy and Candy aren't somebody who's just sitting there typing up minutes and, and, and other board duties. They're actually making sure we follow the law and we appreciate that, so. Anybody else want to make a point before I move on? Appreciate it. Okay. Okay, so I want to request approval. Should I have, wait, Tracy, come up? <laughs> yes. Yes. Does she not have to take an oath or something? I thought she had to take an oath. She doesn't have to take an oath when she's sworn in by the board? <laughs> okay. 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 I know we have to do that. Okay. All right. So, well, let's, let's go ahead. And so I will request approval of the appointment of Tracy Wells as clerk to the Haywood County Board of Commissioners. Uh, I'll, I'll entertain a motion for that. So, so move, move so long as she takes her oath. In front, in front of everybody. At her next meeting. Second. <laughs> okay. All, all those in favor in the cup saying aye. Aye. Okay, that's unanimous. Thank y'all. Thank both y'all. Thank both y'all. Okay, and then the next item is something we added, which was the electrical lines. So what this is, uh, let's see, David, you need to talk about it. So this is approval of relocation of electrical lines at the Francis Farm landfill off the waste in the perimeter of the landfill is what this is for. Correct. Yeah. Um, before I get started, um, you know, thank you. <laughs> We've had a, a, you know, it's a hard job, but uh, Candy and uh, has made it very tolerable. And uh, I'm losing a friend. It works right beside me. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, so, um, so as we get started with the CAP project, the Corrective Action Plan at Francis Farm Landfill, there are electrical lines that are in the waste, actual waste. So part of that is that we need to remove the electrical lines, electrical poles that are penetrating the, 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 way, the waste and move them outside of there. Because what the CAP project basically is, is removing soil in and then a plastic liner on top of that. So the last thing we need to do is after we uh, move the soil and have a plastic liner in there, is then they go poke a hole in there and poke a, a utility line in there. So we're having to move the lines down below what we call, you know, the Lewis property will come up and swing wide out to where it comes up to the Shelton property and connects back to the bus garage there. Uh, we have phase three power there, so we're moving those electrical lines that come along the driveway, moving them back down to Lewis and coming back up that way. And we're also going to do some underground ditching there that will connect the flare and a couple of the uh, uh, monitoring wells there as well too. So Haywood EMC, uh, we've been working with Haywood EMC before the holidays, trying to get the plan uh, situated and everybody approves it and everything good. Late Friday afternoon, everything finally came together. I apologize for having to add to this, the agenda uh, later, but we're trying to get everything up and running and ready to go for that. And we took this outside of the contract where we had better control of that as we uh, would be the managers of that with Haywood. EMC. So that's why it's out of there. So to do all this, Haywood EMC will be moving the lines. We'll also be doing trenching and reconnecting the flare after everything's pulled apart for a cost of $85,860.66. And okay. coming out of the solid waste fund. Coming out of the solid waste fund, yes it is, yeah. These were funds that were anticipated to use during this project as well too. Okay, so who's going who's going to do the work, David? Do you know yet? Hey, hey, with EMC's uh, doing the work. It's it's theirs. Yeah, yeah. We will we will do some trenching. We may have to contract outside of the trenching. Uh, we may have to do that. But other than that, it'll be hey, with EMC and StarTech will be doing the connection back to the flare. Anybody have any? Okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll entertain a motion to approve the relocation of electrical lines at the Francis Farm landfill off the waste and the perimeter of the landfill. Yes. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, so next we'll do a budget amendment. And will Julie, you, if you want to 
speak to that? Yes, yeah, so I can have a budget amendment for you that moves the money from the, uh, the solid waste management special revenue fund into the project fund okay. for the dollar amount. I didn't quite hear. 85,000. Okay, we want to, okay, we're gonna, we'll be moving 90,000. Okay, 90,000. So the budget amendment's for 90,000 to, to handle this. Who, who's that paid to, HEMC? C correct, HEMC, okay. uh, StarTech, and then uh, maybe whoever does the trenching as well. Okay, okay. that's right. Let's see if we do, if they do the trenching or we or go outside of that. Okay. Do I have any questions about the budget amendment? Okay, I'll entertain a motion that we approve $90,000 to be moved from the solid waste fund into the uh, project fund. Yes, that's exactly right. Okay, yeah, to, the to handle this, uh, the relocation of electric lines. So moved. Okay, so is there a second? Second. Okay, any other discussion? All those in favor, you indicate by saying aye. Aye. Uh, okay, that's unanimous. Okay, thank you, Dave. Thank you. Okay, our next order of business is appointments. And we have our county manager, Bryant Moorhead, to talk to speak to those. Okay, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, the first is reappointment of James Pearson, Margaret Pearson, and Lee Mara Odom to the Nursing Home Community Advisory Committee for Long-Term Care. We have an email from Larry Reeves, our ombudsman, who is asking for a full three-year term uh, appointment for all three. And he said they're excellent advocates, advocates for the residents of the nursing facilities in Haywood County. Okay, so I'll request the approval of the reappointments of James Pearson, Margaret Pearson, Lee Morrow Odom to the Nursing Home Community Advisory Committee for a long term care. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. <laughs> and I, I do want to thank these uh, folks for serving on this board. So all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Okay, next is the request approval of reappointments of Ron Reed and Dave, David Gildersleeve to the Haywood County Planning Board. These are just simply reappointments to the Planning Board, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll ask for a motion at this time. So, so move. Second. Okay, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay, and next is the, okay, Brian, next is the request approval of appointments of Jonathan Jackson and Vicki Reese to the Haywood County Fairgrounds Board. Yeah, yes, um, Mr. Jackson has lived uh, in Haywood County for 35 years. He uh, is interested in helping the, uh, the, the fairgrounds board. Miss um, Reese has been a resident of the county for 15 years. And she has a interest in helping the fairgrounds board too. Okay, okay Miss Reese is here this morning. Appreciate you being here. Okay, so I'll entertain a motion that we request approval of appointments of Jonathan Jackson and Vicki Reese to the Haywood County Fairgrounds Board. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay, anyone opposed? Okay. So number four, right? So number four is to request approval of appointment of Dr. <laughs> Lowell Davis to the Health and Human Services Agency Board. Uh, yes. Uh, currently, uh, Dr. Davis uh, serves as Associate Vice Chancellor for Student Services at Western Carolina, serves as President of Fraternity Alumni Association, volunteers with the Baptist Children's Home, and on the Council of Advisors in North Carolina ba Baptist Ch Children's Home. Uh, would just like to uh, be part of the uh, Health and Human Services Board. Okay, I'll entertain a motion that we approve so the moved. Of Dr. Lowell Davis. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay, anyone opposed? Okay, so that concludes. Uh, hey, can we go back to, to one thing? The um, On board. the fairgrounds, were we supposed to approve three? No, just those two. Those, those applications came in, and there was two seats open, and the fairgrounds board. Uh, move those two for, two forward to us. Oh, that was very recommendation. Okay, yeah, so the third, just all the, the, there, there's three on here, but just, we're only approving two, and that's the fairgrounds recommendations. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I noticed that too. That's um, what you caught that. Okay. Part. Okay, is there any other business for the board? I'll uh, entertain a motion we adjourn. So moved. 
Second. Second. Always a favorite. Enjoy saying that. Ah. Okay, we're adjourned. Thank you.